What system actually? Before I start, I would like to thank you everyone who is involved in the organization of this symposium. And I also would like to say a warmest thank you for the invitation. I feel very honored to be part of this symposium, what system actually? And to open this symposium is a small contribution from my side. The title of the conference is the question, what system actually questions our present system and at the same time also the future. A future that we, we imagine, that we can and perhaps even have to stand up for. The title refers to the future at the moment and also to the fact that the future always is in the next moment, it's now. In the frame of the conference, I will speak today about the relationship and connection between art and activism. Basically, I see art and activism as two different forms of expression, both of which operates with the goal and interest of creating a different future in which the social conditions are different. Both activism and art are working with analytical and intervening strategies. I would like to open this with some concrete examples. If we rebel, it's not only for a particular culture. We rebel because of many reasons. We can't not longer breathe. This sentence are from Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon worked as a super Christ and author. But he was also a pan-African activist. In 1952, he published Black Skin, White Mask, and 10 years later, The Unwitched of the Earth, which is still considered as the basic manifesto of anti-colonialism. He works and his, his works and theory have been the result of his activist and professional practice. For movements like Malcolm X, Black Panther movement, Franz Fanon's analyst was very important references. Eight minutes and 46 seconds, a policeman put his knee on the neck and body of George Floyd on 25 May this year in Minneapolis. Several times, George Floyd said, I can't breathe, until he died after eight minutes and 46 seconds. Further mobile phone pictures of the situation taken by other witnesses show that two more policemen were on the body of George Floyd. George, George Floyd's I can't breathe is leading us directly to Franz Fanon. After the murder of George Floyd, there were demonstrations by activists in many cities in the US, but everywhere also here in Germany, under the title Black Lives Matters Against Racism and Police Violence. Racism with, a, with different forms of violence take place in the streets, in public transport, in working spaces, in classrooms, at the school, in universities, in institutions, and also against mini car taxi drivers, as recently in Kassel happened, but also in our school books and in the media. With the film Aufstellung, Harun Fakoki shows us fragments of pictures pictograms, graphics, statistical material, and also text fragments from public materials taken from school books, newspapers, and official state information that relate to the topic of migration, a film without sound. The montage of this initially unbased information is creating a subtext which makes that we can see and recognize the visual violence of these images and with their othering politics. Through the montage, we learn and unlearn in the same time. Forensic architecture is an example for practice that intervenes in political structures. Politic, uh, forensic architecture is um, a research agency 
based at Goldsmiths University of London. They work with human rights organizations, activists and justice groups and media organizations. Forensic architecture works, works as a multidisciplinary research team of architects and scientists from different disciplines. Depending on the causa, specialists for sound, weapons, or artists are included. A small group of activists from the content, context of the unraveling the NSU complex commissioned 2017 forensic architecture to investigate the presence of Andreas Temme during the time when, when Halit Yozgat was killed in the internet cafe in Kasten. Andreas Temme was at that time working as an intelligence agent agency for the German state of Hessen. In a leaked police video, Andreas Temme wants to prove that he did not hear the shots, that he did not see the body of Halit Yozgat. Forensic architecture used this leaked police video as a basic to create their own counter, counter investigation. Forensic architecture usually creates the counter investigations in order to make human rights violation, state violence, and to bring this counter investigations in the current. But the work are always shown also in the context of exhibitions. That means forensic architecture intervenes in the political and legal fields, but at the same time, they bring those counter investigations and materials in exhibition to create and to widen the attention of the public to these political case cases. The question of visibility is a central strategy for both examples. In the end, I can't sp stop to, to about uh, cities that, they, that brand themselves as the brother grim cities in Hessen. Kassel, with the murder of Halid in 2006 and on 6 April, and the murder of the district president Walter Lübcke on 2nd June last year, last year. The murder of Walter Lübcke, Stefan Ernst, and the intelligence agent Andreas Temme have been in touch before. The politician, one actor and two lawyers were act who were active also in the NSO trial are still receiving six months treat emails signed with NSO 20. The personal data of the people were released from the police computers in Hessen, in Hessen, Frankfurt and Wiesbaden. Hanau is also located in, Kassel, in Hessen. The brother Grimm were born there. They also lived nearly 30 years in Kassel. The region around Kassel is also called the Grimm Heimat, like Grimm homeland. However, the open antisemitic of the brother Grimm's fairy tale collectors is only addressed in a few articles. In Hanau, there are flowers and candles on the Brother Grimm Platz. Friends and family members have transformed the statue for Brother Grimm into a place to commemorate those who were murdered on 19th February this year for racist reasons. What system actually? A system that lets us breathe. That was Aisha Gulec. She's an educator and activist researcher who works at the interface of art, art mediation, anti-racism, migration, and community-based building and education. And she's one of the most precious, precious persons that we have got in Kassel. We are very grateful that she was the first person to, space, to speak during this symposium. Now we are live and I would like to welcome everyone here on the internet. We hope that you are all fine. 
My name is David von der Stein. I'm a student at the Konstruktion de Kassel and one of the organizers of this symposium. At that point, I would like to say a big thank you to to Stations of Commons who are cooperating with us on this symposium. Thank you. But now, a short introduction in our topic and the panels that will take place in the framework of the symposium. Lately, the construction and exponential use of terms like essential workers or system relevant have been fooled by the outbreak of the corona pandemic. Within that framework, it is from outstanding significance that all that talking misses to clarify what system everybody actually is talking about. Nevertheless, that system seems to be quite singular and irreplaceable, just like magic. But luckily, we do not believe in magic and therefore we would like to interrogate the exploitative structures of the running system in which even the system relevant work of a person ultimately does not lead to the person being actually relevant to the system and ask ourselves either what it should be good for to work to retain a system from which not everybody is going to benefit equally aiming to imagine alternatives that move beyond notions of competition and exploitation and share strategies about how to make this happen is what we want to do during this symposium. I will now hand over to my colleague, Angela Anderson. Thanks a lot, David, and uh, it's great to see so many people here uh, taking part in the symposium today. Uh, my name is Angela Anderson, and I'm a Kunstlerische Mitarbeiterin um, with Bjorn Melhus here at the Kassel Kunstvolle And I'll be moderating the panel's working conditions and who's award actually, which I will tell you a bit more about later. Um, but the months preceding Preceding the onset of our current, current global health emergency, some major uprisings, in particular in Chile and in Lebanon, against neoliberal economies and their politics of austerity, and the rampant inequality inherent in economic systems which thrive upon exploitation and debt. As the microscopic critter known as COVID-19 began to multiply itself exponentially throughout human bodies, the inherent inability and indeed unwillingness of economic systems based on profit to care for the health and safety of their subjects became more blatant than ever. As those rendered most vulnerable to an already inhospitable system through the intersections of racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, and ableism suffered the most during this pandemic, the collision of this toxic virus with capitalism's toxic economic system of value has laid bare yet again the urgent need for the immediate restructuring of the organization of our collective earthly bodies. With such an urgent task at hand, one might ask what role artistic practice has to play in the reconfiguration of our economic and subjective relations to each other as well as to the more than human others which surround us. I would posit that artistic thinking which it, with its constant interrogation of the relation of form and content is of vital importance in this current moment. And I look forward to discussing this very topic with our many uh, interesting invited guests during this symposium. So thank you very much. And I will pass the word on to Nora Sternfeld. Thank you very much. I will quickly speak about the content, the program of the two days. So the first day is dedicated to questions, as you already have seen with Aisha's introduction, at the nexus of art and activism, theory and politics, proposing strategies to act within neoliberalism and imagine another system to make it happen already now. We heard about some of the related topics and questions from David and Angela. The second day looks at the topic from a perspective of curatorial strategies and exhibition studies. Here, history and histories come into play. The canon is questioned by a haunted past, 
We will hear proposals of sounds and specters of exhibition histories by curators and researchers in the field of exhibition studies. My name is Nora Sternfeld. I am documenta professor here at the Kunsthochschule Kassel and also part of the organizing team of the symposium. I would like to add a big thank you to my colleagues Karina Herring and to Chidem Özdemir for working with us on the announcement of the conference. And I will now hand over to Grégoire Rousseau, who is one of the hosts of this symposium. Yes, thank you, Nora. So thank you everyone for the invitation and thank you everyone that is watching now. Uh, my name is Grégoire Rousseau. I am a member of Station of uh, Commons. Station of Commons stands for the reappropriation of technology within uh, public space. So we've been working with uh, Juan since uh, late February to develop an agency of critical digital practices trying to find open source technology to find distance from the major industry and try to find our own way of doing and our own way of uh, thinking. And to refer to this crisis, we as, as I said, we, we met and developed the first time in uh, late February. And as the crisis happened in mid-March, uh, mid then we had two possibilities, like either we would uh, stop and postpone as we were, as everybody was getting those mails that things will not happen or we don't know when would be the normal new time. So we decided to go the other way and then we decided to accelerate the process. And as we were accelerating the process, we had, were at the same time questioning and trying to challenge those big monsters, uh, Zoom and uh, Facebook, Instagram, who were standing as an alternative of physical meeting. And so we were thinking, what is the alternative of this alternative? So we launched uh, a quick uh, a website with our small uh, material resources and we offered uh, artists means of uh, audio broadcasting. It was something that was extremely uh, important for us was to provide an uh, open platform for artists, sound artists in particular, to still keep working and keep, to keep their uh, artistic practice active. So from that, the feedback was been, has been very good. And then we've been working with some performers from uh, actually all over Europe, uh, Athens, Madrid, Paris, some other place in uh, Finland as well. Then we developed again, trying to find as well some uh, discursive place in the website. You, you can find situated tutorials on the website, stationofcommons.org. And, 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 and develop a video stream. So we were quite conscious of the uh, path uh, of data. And in that sense, we, we are now putting effort toward uh, means of information, means of communication, and uh, more importantly, uh, knowledge sharing. So now we are working on peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology briefly is uh, how uh, users can connect one to another, but not by the transit of a third party. We want uh, people, uh, work, co-workers, colleagues, uh, to exchange information by excluding this third party that is uh, taking this data to valorize it, to turn it into value and more control. So this is the, the research that we are doing now. And it is implemented already for this symposium if you go to the so-called alternative uh, room where you find uh, embedded uh, the Zoom, uh, Etapad, and uh, file sharing. The point of this file sharing is to implement this peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology in order to form a distributed library, which means that this library would not be located in uh, only one server, but distributed among the users to again avoid this like hegemonic uh, center, this hegemonic uh, position of <clears throat> that we want to escape. Uh, moreover, on the Station of Common uh, website, you will find uh, only the video stream for people who do not want to use the Zoom. So you will find the link on the website and uh, as well, you will find the Etherpad where you can uh, write comments and and maybe question of translations. I think that someone else should continue. Yeah, unfortunately, Lorena Vicini, who is a very dear colleague and member of the team of organizers. Ah, she's here! Good! Ah, perfect on time, amazing. Hi, so Hi. I'm Lorena Vicini. I'm very glad to be here presenting and organizing this symposium with all my colleagues. 
I'm currently based in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. So it's also a transnational symposium. And I'm also PhD candidate at the Kunsthochschule Kassel. So uh, I'll speak a bit about the contribution of the research seminar exhibition studies in the second day of the symposium that will happen tomorrow. So the research seminar takes place one week per semester, normally in Kassel, and this year due to the pandemic situation online. And the aim is both very pragmatic towards advancing research processes and admitting that research is full of loopings, black ages, and new beginnings. So when we meet once or twice a year, a year we share strategies, knowledge, production, uh, analysis, reflection, investigation, and imagination strategies. We discuss methodologies, readings, explore approaches, and allow us to encounter dead ends. The research seminar participants were invited to contribute to the session sounds and specters of the exhibition stories that will happen tomorrow, on the 8th of July, by the end of the day, on the final part of the symposium. They will be sharing uh, new and unexpected approaches regarding music, ghosts, and other non-material material appearances in the exhibition stories. And our next speaker that I have the honor to announce is Oliver Machat. His contribution has the title Democratizing Democracy. And Oliver Machat is a political theorist and philosopher. He's currently professor of political theory at the University of Vienna. So let's hear his contribution. Okay, hello. Um, so I was asked to say a few words about what I think what the system is and you know uh, what we shall do with it. And here we go. In a grim joke from the 1930s, a German Jew is looking desperately for a country of exile. He enters a shop and asks for a globe. After having searched on the globe without success, he asks the shopkeeper, do you have another globe? This cynical joke gives expression to the nightmare of a world without alternatives. It is in fact the very nightmare that motivated Hannah Arendt, herself a one-time refugee, to caution against the notion of a global state. If there would be only one system or a global state, no place of exile would exist anymore. And there would be no salesperson to ask for another globe. But our immediate problem is not the world state. As a political entity, such a global state without borders remains, for the time being, science fiction. As a political entity, such a global state does not exist in the near future. The problem is that, in a certain sense, we already seem to be living in a world without political alternatives, in a world of neoliberal politics that is dominated by the famous Tina principle derived from Margaret Thatcher's famous there is no alternative, or by what the French called la pensée unique, a single way of thinking that dominates most political parties, including parties nominally on the left. This has certainly affected our understanding of democracy. Wherever we turn today, democracy appears to be the rule of the political game. There is a widespread sense that democracy has turned into the unsurpassable horizon of our political affairs. Yet a no less widespread sense has emerged that this horizon is crumbling now. Of course, neither side of this dilemma has gone unnoticed. In recent years, many observers have pointed out that today's well-established democracies, to which no feasible alternative can be imagined, do not live up to their own promises. The poor performance of many actually existing democratic regimes, at least in terms of popular empowerment, does not seem to match the stupendous ways in which these regimes portray democracy as something already realized. One only has to think of the ongoing infringement of human rights, the economic deprivation of increasingly large sectors of the population, the effective denial of citizens' participation in the actual processes of decision-making and other well-known factors that contribute to democratic disaffection. According to Colin Crouch, arguably the most prominent defender of the idea 
that we are living in times of what he calls post-democracy, democracy has evolved towards a state in which its institutions continue existing as empty shells. Whereas elections are still being held, the party platforms tend to become indistinguishable. Political decisions are influenced by lobbying groups and public opinion by spin doctors, by citizens fall into apathy and frustration. The welfare state, once responsible for a more democratic distribution of social wealth, will be reduced to a minimum in the foreseeable future to the implementation of austerity packages after Corona even more than before, and other neoliberal policies in the interest of just a small economic elite. It is this elite's increasing dominance together with the disproportionate political power of corporations, which as Crouch and others suspect, should be understood to be, dri to be the driving force behind most tendencies toward de-democratization. Now, what is the system today? It could be argued that Western liberal democracy has entirely merged with capitalism as it is closely articulated with the promotion of a free market or has even become by and large synonymous with capitalism. For this reason, democracy as an all encompassing horizon without alternative has been rejected by some on the left. Rejected precisely because, as for instance, Slavoj Žižek has argued, of democracy's worldwide hegemony. What people like Žižek, Alain Badiou, and some others would like to do is to step out of the democratic horizon, is to transgress the horizon of democracy as such. However, they, as a rule, cannot provide any answer as to what one can expect to find behind the horizon. Some call it communism, but they can't really explain what that means. The problem is that one must not conflate democracy with the particular Western liberal capitalist version of democracy, and then seek to step outside that very horizon. The fact that there is not a wholesale alternative available to the democratic horizon does not, at any rate, imply that it is impossible to redefine the horizon from within. It is possible to redefine democracy because its current hegemonic meaning, the Western liberal capitalist one, is the contingent outcome of historical struggles. A process, like any process of struggle, is which is, by definition, open-ended. So there is no reason why it should be impossible to fight for a, let's say, more radical, egalitarian, and participatory version of democracy, a fight which definitely would take place within the horizon of democracy, but against that particular imposter, Western liberal democracy, which presents itself as a democracy's final and total incarnation. This is exactly what is happening right now in all sorts of democratic activism. Contemporary activism, be it in the States, if we think of the Black Lives Matter movement or in Hong Kong or in basically any other place, does not as a rule locate itself in the tradition of revolutionary mo movements that try to transgress the horizon of allegedly formal bourgeois democracy. Contemporary activism locates itself in a different tradition in the tradition, for instance, of the civil rights movement, which sought to expand that very horizon. One of the many names for such an expansion is radical democracy, the radicalization of demands for equality and the pluralization of the areas in which such demands are articulated. Radical democratic practices, as diverse as they might be, share one thing, they locate themselves within the horizon of democracy while simultaneously fighting against the liberal ideology of a supposedly realized democracy so, they, so that they insist on the unrealized nature of contemporary democracy. Therefore, those new activist practices cannot be reduced anymore to a single ideological core or a homogeneous world, worldview Rather, they are structured as a contingent connection of a plurality of demands. What unites them then is not so much a positive content 
then the conviction and, insist and insistence with respect to actually existing democracy that this is not it. They are radically democratic in the sense that they are driven by the conviction that democracy is far from being realized under conditions of corporate power and the worldwide hegemony of some sections of the West. Therefore, the main antagonism today is not one between democracy and its totalitarian other, as at the time of the Cold War uh, narrative, but it runs right through the core of democracy. It is the antagonism between actually existing liberal capitalist regimes, which claim to have realized democracy on the one hand, and ongoing processes of and demands for radical democratization on the other. This antagonism, an antagonism internal to democracy, is what is enacted by forms of democratic activism that carry the demands for equality into more and more social spheres. In that sense, there is not a single system, but there is a system which is internally split into two basic alternatives. Liberal demo democracy, as we know it, married to capitalist neoliberalist regimes and radical democracy. Thank you. Great, so welcome back everyone. Um, this is the first panel of our symposium uh, entitled Working Conditions. Uh, I have a short introduction prepared and then I will uh, introduce our guests and then we can, um, yes, listen to their wonderful contributions, uh, which will be followed by a discussion and a Q&A. So to feel free after after they're done presenting to jump in with questions, to type them into the chat or into the etherpad, or even uh, ask them uh, through your audio, through your microphones. So um, when countries in Eastern Europe resorted to shutting down their borders, <clears throat> oh, sorry, countries in Europe <laughs> resorted to shutting down their borders to international travel in March of this year, in an attempt to slow the spread of COVID-19, Farmers in Western Europe were suddenly faced with a shortage of workers for the upcoming harvest. As their panic-like response began to make headlines with largely unsuccessful campaigns for workers, and in some cases, even volunteers from within the country's borders themselves, the open secret of Western Europe's reliance on low-paid, hardworking migrant labor on countries in Eastern Europe to maintain the agriculture sector in Western Europe came crashing into the media spotlight. With images from the airport in Cluj-Napoca in Romania showing masses of people queuing for hours in cramped conditions with no mask or distance between them, waiting to board charter flights to Germany in order to harvest the holy crop of asparagus and other vegetables, it became clear whose health was considered to be sacrificable in order to maintain the smooth functioning of Western Europe's food supply chain. With this and many other examples in mind, it was extremely important to me to address the topic of labor and working conditions of these and other essential workers within the context of this symposium. And I'm very happy to have Kathleen Erodi, Cecilia Vallejos, and Matisse de Breña here with us on this panel today um, to share with us their expertise from the various fields that they've been working in now for many years. Uh, Kathleen Erodi is a curator and activist with the Cisionere campaign for agricultural workers in Austria, as well as the Vienna-based Precarity Office. And she will give us an overview and analysis of the current labor conditions in the food production systems of Austria and Germany today, and in particular, uh, contextualizing them within this economic and political relations of post-socialist countries uh, to the EU. And following Cecilia, the artists, uh, Amsterdam-based artists and new professors at Casa Kunsthochschule, Cecilia Vallejos and Matisse de Breña, will present their work with the Dutch Union of Cleaners uh, and Domestic Workers in the Netherlands, addressing the, uh, the role of artistic practice in the context of social organizing and labor movements. So welcome to all of you here. And um, Katalin, uh, if you're welcome to take the stage. Ah, thank you so much. And actually, I would like to share my screen. I don't know if that's uh, possible. Thank you very much, uh, Angela, for the invitation. And um, 
I, I am uh, a curator and an art worker as well, but uh, at the moment I will be primarily speaking as an activist of the Saisonary campaign, as you mentioned. So one of the first images that I wanted to show, of course, as we are talking about labor struggles in the field of agriculture, that uh, there is uh, definitely in Austria, but also in Germany and uh, other uh, Western and Eastern European countries, a very important history of these labor struggles. This is one struggle that you can see on the first image that the Saisonary campaign uh, was also connected to. The campaign itself was started in 2014, so we now have uh, around six years of uh, activities to look back onto. And it started as a collaboration between uh, independent activists and the uh, Proge, which is the trade union in Austria active in the field of uh, agricultural work. And uh, also together with uh, some other um, partners who I would like to mention, because I think it's very important also to see on what intersection uh, the situation of uh, agricultural workers can be situated. So we work together with the uh, UNDOC in Austria, which is uh, an Anlaufstelle, a platform for undocumented workers. We work together with uh, Nieleni, uh, which is a forum for food sovereignty and uh, also with LEFU and MENVIA, both of whom uh, are associations uh, that are looking into um, human smuggling and uh, um, I don't know how yeah actually so um, uh, how do you I'm sorry I forgot the name like what's it called when you're trading in humans mention hand uh, yeah human trafficking human trafficking thank you sorry about that uh, so just so also to understand that, of course, the situation of harvest workers can very often also be linked to issues around human trafficking, as well as these larger questions around uh, undocumented work, as well as food sovereignty. Uh, so this, uh, the second image, can you see it okay or is it uh, okay? Uh, because it seems that I need to scroll for some reason, it's not uh, going from page to page. So the second image that I would like to show is of our uh, website, which is, uh, I mean, now I'm showing the English version, but uh, actually it's a multilingual website. So also to understand the uh, agricultural work uh, in Austria, but also I think we can say this of most of uh, Western European countries is almost exclusively done by migrants. So aside from, of course, the farmers or the employers themselves, the people working on the fields are almost always coming from other countries, either to Austria or to Germany. I mean, this is also what we encountered into the, in the news. That's why there was such a, a lack of workforce. So therefore, for example, uh, with Saisonary, as we are running a campaign for the rights of agriculture workers, it is extremely essential that we communicate in several languages. So if you go to our website, you can find it in languages ranging from Romanian, Hungarian, Bulgarian, Ukrainian, uh, Bosnian, uh, and Serbo-Croatian, because it's uh, extremely essential that everybody, and it's very different uh, migrant groups from uh, the neighboring countries of Austria and also beyond, who are traveling for seasonal work in agriculture has access to information. So one of the main issues that our campaign addresses is actually the lack of access to information for workers in agriculture. And uh, so the difficulty of having uh, very concrete information about uh, working rights, but also working conditions. And just to give you a bit of insight, this is uh, very similar probably in Germany as well. In case, uh, I mean, in the case of Austria, uh, agricultural work is regulated by collective contracts, which sounds very good because these collective contracts are negotiated uh, mostly by the trade unions, but not always. So not in all negotiations, the trade union is actually involved. But what is very important to know, also to have an imagination of what complexity migrant workers have to negotiate, in the nine federal states of Austria, there are nine different collective contracts which are regulating agricultural work, which means that actually what you can earn, so the minimum wage is defined differently in all nine federal states. And there are also, depending on the negotiations, 
uh, very often different conditions. This is always also depending on how uh, strong the negotiating partners are. So of course, where the trade union is involved, you have better chances of having uh, better conditions, but sometimes where they are not involved, um, I mean, uh, it's most often the farmers union and uh, the agricultural uh, chamber of uh, like commerce that, whose interests are most prevalent on these negotiations. And it's also important to understand, so just to say a few facts, the netto wage is around seven euro per hour. So it's six euro something up to seven euro, which means that the brutto wage, so the gross wage is around 1,500, but in most federal states, it doesn't reach 1,500 euros. And just also to understand, because Oliver Machat beforehand was mentioning how in in what way do these uh, liberal democracies deliver actually on their promises? So this minimum wage is actually under the, the, the level which is considered to be endangered, the, like, into, like it's, a, the pover it's under the poverty level. So it's obviously not even defined with people in mind who would actually be on the longer term living in the country that they work in because uh, clearly it's not a living wage. So if you are earning a long term under the poverty level in Austria, you cannot uh, consider this a living wage. And it's even outrageous, uh, I believe, uh, and this is also something that Cezanneri is fighting for, to raise the wages at least above the poverty level, which is this uh, 1,500 euros. So it's, I think this is important also to understand like what are the conditions on the ground for workers who come to Austria. But all that I mentioned until now, this is the conditions uh, regulated by collective contracts. So if they would be fulfilled, these would be the conditions. And the problem that we experience uh, on the fields, also talking with the workers, and then later on in the labor struggles, is that actually these conditions are not fulfilled. So one uh, very important uh, agenda in our um, and our campaign is to go to the field and bring information to the workers. As I already mentioned, we work with flyers and also online presence in several languages. Because another thing that uh, I recently with the corona uh, uh, pandemic, we've been discussing a lot about socially, social distancing. But we have to understand that, for example, agricultural work is an extremely isolated uh, work. So, uh, I mean, of course, workers are not socially distanced from one another, but they're definitely distanced in many ways from the societies in which they are working. So they are mostly invisible on the fields. Usually accommodation is provided by the farmers uh, themselves. And uh, very often as uh, the working hours uh, go until, I mean, legally they should only go until 12 hours. Very often they go beyond that. So there is very little chance of encounter. So that is also why it is important for us as activists to go to the fields and to meet the workers and to be able to share with them the information uh, on their uh, working rights. And uh, also just to uh, make uh, the work of the campaign a bit more complex, uh, uh, in the past years, we've also done a campaign of information videos and interviews. So one, uh, image that you can see here is the making of one of these uh, information videos where actually uh, the, the man a bit in the background uh, was uh, also a harvest worker who fought for his rights uh, successfully um, before court. So he was giving an interview also to share his, uh, his struggles uh, with uh, other colleagues and to encourage them uh, to stand up for their rights because this is maybe something that we will talk about later on that uh, it's uh, not uh, such an easy situation uh, for uh, people, uh, I mean, the, for the workers uh, in very isolated conditions to stand up uh, for their rights and to try to uh, fight for better working conditions. And another aspect of the work of Cezanneri is also, I mean, a small example, 
is a lecture performance uh, which uh, was uh, created a few years ago, a theater performance which used the protocols of the Cezanneary campaign and of the labor struggles that the campaign was connected to to share information more broadly about uh, the situation of seasonal workers. Uh, so just to share also a few images of, uh, of uh, activists of the campaign on the field. This is in Tirol, as uh, you can maybe tell from the high mountains in the background. Uh, this is uh, a chance to talk with workers uh, in their, during their lunch break. But what is, it, what is also important to understand, so these encounters uh, with workers on the field is not at all uncomplicated. So first of all, we also have to go through the hierarchies of uh, working uh, relations on the field. So most of the time the workers have a, a work coordinator or something that's in German called Vorarbeiter or sometimes even the farmer is present. So of course for us as well to be able to protect the workers. So we always go through the hierarchy because otherwise very often uh, it's the workers who can get into trouble for talking to us. And of course the reaction to us spreading information is uh, very diverse. I wanted to bring in, so this is what uh, Angela already mentioned, uh, like during the pandemic, all this discussion about shortage of workers. Of course, it was extremely present, not only in Germany and Austria, but uh, also in the UK. And uh, as you already mentioned, uh, which I find very important to uh, also maybe uh, discuss a bit more in detail. So there were different platforms created uh, for to find uh, workers, so to say, or helpers uh, locally for the farmers, which was extremely, I mean, polemic, but also problematic because I think in uh, Germany, it was called as Land Hilft, the country helps, which is funny because it's country and countryside. I mean, the word in German is, is the same. So you also have this double meaning in uh, Austria, it was called the Lebensmittel Helper, uh, Helfer, so the food helpers, so to say. They also had a similar platform in uh, Britain. And uh, what's incredibly important also to look at, that the discourse on this, these platforms, so the rhetoric was extremely patriotic and very nationalist. And maybe this is something important to uh, mention that, for example, in Austria, there was quite a bit of discussion around the fact that the Chancellor Sebastian Kurz during the pandemic in a, a series of his speeches was only addressing the dear Austrians, so to say. So whereas, I mean, the country is definitely one of uh, a significant migrant population, but also, I mean, notwithstanding the migrant workers who are actively contributing uh, to essential work. And I uh, just also already with this uh, choice of uh, news, I wanted to signal that immediately with the need for workers, after workers were flown in, there was of course an immediate discussion about what gaps are existing in the protection of workers on the field. And in fact, in Austria, there was also a bigger discussion around the farmer who uh, locked his workers into their houses. So in order to ensure that they stay, so to say, in quarantine, uh, he uh, limited their freedom of movement, which is, of course, I mean, legally, um, I mean, he's at the moment being, uh, this case is being investigated. But I think it's also important to understand, so what is the status of essential workers and how they are being, um, yeah, how they are being treated. And these are the images that you already mentioned, Angela. So this is the airport of Cluj. The first, uh, like I think it was one of the first uh, rounds of flights that were leaving to Germany. And I mean, here it becomes clear that, uh, I mean, there are very different or I mean, at least double standards existing for even the conditions in which these workers travel to Europe. So this is another image from a Romanian portal, which uh, shows even better the dimension of the, of the crowd and of the people waiting. And uh, I mean, this is then a later article which appeared on the Guardian, which of course poses this question. So what is like, what is the value of uh, food 
uh, and food production in Europe as opposed to workers' house. And uh, there were, I mean, what, what I was trying to say in the beginning, that of course the so-called normality, which I think we should uh, definitely not return to, had already been an extremely exploitative and precarious reality for workers in agriculture across Europe. And it's very uh, ambiguous because of course one could say that now the pandemic shows how essential this work is and actually most farmers uh, when they were rejecting the volunteers they were talking about needing their experienced professional workforce whereas beforehand they were always talking about uh, unskilled laborers so i think there is this also this interesting aspect of how is the language changing but at the same time nevertheless the conditions did not uh, change um, at all and i mean now i would like to give you insight into the conditions so we had uh, recently a case with sezoneri near um, Vienna in Lower Austria, also at an asparagus harvest, where these were the conditions in which the workers uh, were housed. And uh, just so that you know, for this accommodation, they were asked to pay four euros per person per night. So if you would like to do a bit of math, like with six to eight beds in one room, you can calculate how much in total was paid for one room. And I mean also, so you can really see that uh, if we talk about what are the safety conditions uh, that um, uh, we are like in general in public space asked to follow, et cetera, and then what were the conditions in which uh, these workers uh, had to um, live. And uh, so we have at the moment uh, a case uh, which uh, was at, in the beginning one person uh, protesting and now it seems that uh, she, also met, so she also could organize several of her colleagues so now we're talking about six, seven people protesting but this is maybe something that we can also discuss like how difficult it is to organize and also what is for example our role as an activist campaign also to support workers who are who are willing and who have the courage and the will uh, to protest and uh, that support is of course very much needed also interpersonally. And here is also another image which might be familiar. This is from the protests in Bornheim, which happened recently in Germany and where of course the anarcho-syndicalist flag is already talking about the fact that uh, uh, the I think it was the Freie Arbeiterinnen Union, so it was the Union of uh, Free Workers and Anarcho-Syndicalist uh, Collective who were immediately present and supporting the workers. And this is extremely important and uh, a huge lack in Austria that there is not uh, such a strong organization of anarcho-syndicalists, so this kind of uh, other forms of organizing, not only the trade unions of social democracy. And I just wanted to refer to the fact uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, if we will, we will be later on talking about the artistic uh, work that, uh, and uh, I mean, the practices of Cecilia and Matthijs, and I'm very eager and looking forward to hearing more about your practice. But I just wanted to also talk about the lack of, uh, or I mean, in a way there is of course image production, also historical image production about harvest protests and harvest strikes. And for us to understand that of course, this, um, so to say this, uh, tension or this uh, dilemma of labor struggles between farmers and land workers is of course an extremely historical one. Nevertheless, actually there is, I, I believe, a lack of images and also a lack of knowledge. This is actually from a Hungarian, um, Hungarian artist um, from the beginning of the 20th century. So what we also have to understand beginning of 20th century across Europe but also in particularly in uh, Eastern Europe, there were huge anarcho-syndicalists, like agrarian socialist movements, like mobilizing 10,000s of people. So it's also what's happening now, or the lack of protest is actually, I think, a, a huge question, which uh, hinges, of course, on uh, the conditions in the neighboring countries. I also wanted to show a few less, uh, like, less historical images, but still historical. I mean, I think this is also an important work that uh, in case, I mean, we 
want to engage with labor struggles, the history of labor struggles is definitely an important one. This is from uh, actually from Texas, where interestingly, I read very shortly into this, but in solidarity, people stopped consuming grapes when this protest was going on. So it's also an important question. What do we have to do to show solidarity? What are uh, like the means of consumers? And uh, I wanted to show another image and maybe very shortly to talk about the effect of how, um, so how are, how are these situations interconnected? Now we were talking about Austria, but as I said, like migrant workers are coming from very many different countries of the region. This is a protest in rural Hungary. It was happening last week. I'm showing it because the Hungarian media is not talking about it. It's uh, people working in a clothing factory who have not been paid for two months now and 530 uh, families are affected and uh, were protesting. And so I think something that we need to discuss uh, much more and much more in detail is the fact that uh, I mean, the failure, so to say, of European integration, and uh, also due, of course, to uh, the neoliberal capitalist uh, system in which uh, we exist, and the fact that the beneficiaries of the European integration were definitely not the Eastern European countries, uh, and also in the case of Austria, Austria is very specifically a country which benefited economically hugely from European integration in terms of workforce, but also in terms of uh, corporate investment in these countries and expansion. So this is something that happened and uh, is still happening. And of course, the, the, another fact is that now I will just uh, show a Hungarian example, but, uh, oh, well, I would show if, oh, yeah. So the fact that uh, the working conditions and especially labor law and labor rights in the neighboring countries of Austria and in most of the Eastern European countries are very precarious. I mean, just to mention Hungary in 2018 and also in the very beginning of the Corona crisis, two so-called slave laws were passed which are basically emptying the labor law, the existing labor law of its contents. Uh, they are changing, uh, I mean, they're giving more rights to the employers and taking rights away from the employees in terms of uh, paid vacation, working time, etc., which was essential now in the pandemic because of course everybody had to be sent, uh, uh, so to say, on vacation. So basically the Hungarian employers uh, were asking for the rights to send people on a vacation in advance, so to say, so that they can then, uh, it's kind of like a credit that you get of vacation and so they can take away, so give you in, in advance the vacation that you would have in the next year, so to say, so that they don't, uh, I mean, so that the conditions are, are better for them and, uh, and uh, more exploitative uh, for the workers. And of course, I mean, certain governments also support such politics as the Hungarian government does. So this is just something that I think that uh, this kind of interdependence and interconnectedness of why migrant workers move and under what conditions they are willing to move, uh, it's in extremely important uh, to uh, understand in depth the situation of neighboring countries. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I know that this is something we could talk about for probably for hours, but I think um, Matis and Cecilia, maybe we can go right to your talk because um, time, time is just running. So, and then we can open it up for a discussion and a conversation afterwards, if that's okay. Okay, first I will show you two images. This is one of 2005 and this is one of 2019 and actually is the same organization is the trade union of cleaners in the netherlands and what you see here is now how it used to be and this is how it is right now and what you could say this is the result of what you call organizing when workers get organized and also it is the result of having artists embedded in a political movement or in a trade union um, when we talk about how to improve working conditions, and in our case, cleaners and domestic workers, um, we, we also would like to talk about 
um, what role can an artist play in this? But first I will talk about the organization itself. What you see here is from the left to the right is Thijs, Koksal and Koulibaly. These are three Dutch cleaners. And um, if you go back to the first image, you see that it looks a bit different at that time. There was a problem um, in 2005 inside the trade union, and that was the shop stewards, that are the people, that's the workers who represent other workers. Um, in fact, in 2005, you could say they were not representing uh, their colleagues in a good way. Uh, because, as you see, uh, most of the um, um, cleaners in the Netherlands have a migrant background and also, and that's maybe even more important, most of the cleaners in the Netherlands um, are women. So if the shop stewards at, in 2005 were mainly men, uh, old white men, and the workers were completely different. So how do you change this? Well. One of the things what they did, um, and it started more or less in 2008, was uh, starting up a parliament, a parliament of cleaners. That means that they were looking for so what you call natural leaders, people who could represent their colleagues in a good way. And um, these leaders, they um, came together and they were discussing the problems and also they were advising um, the administrators of the union what to do. Also very important is that the, it is the parliament who takes decisions and that in the, in the past it was different. In the past it was the administrators of the trade union were taking decisions and they changed this, the more democratic model that the, um, the workers, the cleaners were taking decisions. And in order to have also, and um, here you can say they are discussing and taking decisions, and also very important is that the cleaners in the Netherlands, they have also a government chosen by the parliament and also they have a president. And you see here, uh, you see here, here uh, with the microphone in her hand is Kadisha Yati. And that's also what you could say is our president nowadays. Um, then the question that we come up, what role can an artist play in this process of organization to organize your trade union in another way? Well, in my case, um, it happened that I had an exhibition in a museum. It was in Madrid, I think it was Reine Sofia. Reine mm -hmm. Sofia, it was. And then uh, I had an, um, an, um, an exhibition dealing with labor, but inside the museum. And I was already having my doubts about, you know, is this the right place to show a work about labor inside the museum and if you look to the visitors of a museum you say well is this the right public for this work so i was already looking around for having contact with trade unions in the netherlands but um, by accident they called me that was quite interesting because they called me because they had a question to say we want you um, to make a um, work a museum for the cleaners so there I started and the plan was to do this, uh, uh, to create a museum inside uh, the central hall of the um, uh, railway station in Utrecht, what you see here on the, on the photo. So I created a plan and then that was really interesting for me as an artist, I had to go to the parliament and I had to present my ID, my plan for the exhibition of uh, the museum to the parliament and finally they took the decision and they said, yes, we want to have it. So then it started. Here you can see this is the final, uh, when the opening of the museum, you see the museum in the background. The museum was built up uh, objects and it were the cleaners who were collecting these objects. And I, uh, the only thing, or the, the thing what I did, I was helping with them with collecting. And also I was uh, recording stories what we could connect with um, uh, the objects and were stories about their labor condition. And um, you could say at that moment, this was in 2011, um, the labor conditions were already improving, but it went slow. 
Nowadays, if you talk about 2019, the labor conditions of cleaners in the Netherlands improved really a lot. You could say that uh, you can better work in, uh, as a cleaner than in the security or to work in the hospital even. They earn more, um, their conditions are better. Uh, also, one very important element uh, we won is that cleaners are allowed to learn Dutch during work time. What is a very in, important element, and also this creates a lot of, let's say, active um, uh, members, so activists, people who can play an important role also in the, um, uh, in the parliament. It's also very important to say that working inside the union is not, let's say, for an artist, not, a, you could better not call it a research, but you can better call it a way of working. Um, also, you could say that the goal, of course, is to support a campaign uh, for better payment, better work conditions, but also, and that's maybe more important, and they, they explained me this already uh, from the beginning on, they said, Matthijs, for us this, of course, you help us, you support a campaign, but more important it is, uh, it is for an artist to create an identity for the Dutch workers of the 21st century. Because nowadays, if you look to the workers, if we go back to the three men, for example, um, it was not by purpose that they call them Dutch cleaners, but in fact, they are called, let's say, Hollands, Thijs is an Hollander, uh, Koksal is a uh, Turkish guy, and then Koulibaly is an African person. So they are, somebody else is focusing on their identity based on ethnicity. And for artists, it's very important to get organized, to become a collective together, and that everybody can say, I'm a cleaner, I'm a Dutch cleaner. Maybe you can continue. Yeah. And uh, within the same union, there, uh, there is another sector which is not so um, visible as uh, the other cleaners that we just saw the pictures, who are cleaning trains or hospitals or other institutions. So they are the domestic workers. Exactly this um, sign says, uh, we must be invisible. So domestic workers are people who uh, clean private houses. So they mostly work alone. Um, they uh, come from Philippines, Indonesia, Ghana, Latin America. So they are undocumented. Uh, also, their labor is not recognized as real labor. Whether they are documented or undocumented, it doesn't matter. It's like they have no contract, no vacation, no sick leave. There is no bargaining agreement. So basically, um, in general, they have very good relationship with their employer, but they are not accessing the system as the other cleaners. Um, being undocumented also has several other um, areas of problems. That is one, for instance, housing or healthcare. Healthcare, of course, is not really that they have a direct access to that because their labor is not recognized, because they are undocumented. And housing is actually quite an invisible problem as well. And that might be, we can say, a source of um, exploitation or where exploitation can happen, but it's from within the groups. So it's not really the story that the white people can um, profit from this, but it's basically within the groups of Latin American or from Ghana or from Indonesia, or from Philippines, that they exploit the ones who are the newcomers, let's say, in, the, in terms of housing only. So um, we can say that undocumented workers are part of the trade unions and for the traditional organization from the federation actually that was not an obvious thing so it took a little bit of time to have this group integrated officially live in the head office well yeah, yeah well yeah so the, their position was a little bit more vulnerable than the other ones that we have seen before in the other images that matthias showed so as domestic worker happens um uh, as a non-regular, um, regularized activity in terms of labor laws, um, there were a lot of uh, attempts to make this problem visible within the union, especially when there was um, uh, the International Labor Organization that released a treaty that was the ILO Convention 100 
1989, and that gave uh, the chance to make a campaign to push the issue of why not to regularize the labor of people who are many, that they work basically for um, high class, uh, the high class of Dutch society. They uh, also have a good relationship with their employer at a certain extent that they give them the keys, they take care of their kids, so it's actually the issue is not treating them as criminals, it, it was not really um, an issue that the, the, the union could uh, see anymore going further because that the criminalization was also part of the whole uh, plot of not regularizing the labor. So this uh, ILO Convention um, 189 uh, was a treaty that was voted for in, in many um, European countries. But the, the treaty to become a law needs to be ratified in every country. So it can circulate within the legislation of every European country. So that was in Holland, not ratified. So that was the, the campaign was done because of that. So the struggle uh, of these workers in particular was not with employers, but with the state. And therefore they joined the union. So maybe we can go to the next picture. So um, because of this treaty uh, and the campaign that the, the um, union launched, there was an idea of making a publication for um, uh, the international conference that took place in 2007. And that was uh, international, international conference, or is a company, international conference, um, hosted by the Social and Economic Council of the Netherlands. This is a place, the council, that has an advisory board in which employers, organizations, and unions work together with uh, the government preparing how to make decisions. So we made, uh, together with the domestic workers, this publication, which was not a report, it's not basically what, what circulates in this kind of conferences, it was a bit different. Uh, it's a publication that now we see it online, but well, it has this size, so it was very easy to read, very easy to distribute that day among the participants of this conference. Um, it was actually, um, with words that are from the convention, the ILO Convention uh, 189, and not definitions, but stories of the real domestic workers at work in relation to this word. So basically our uh, intention with that was to um, get away from the abstraction of the words of this treaty and bring it more to the real level of what stories actually happen in relation to women, in relation to contract, in relation to working agreement, in relation to what is actually domestic work, what do they do? Some people don't even know what, what is that work. It always happens indoor. So, uh, unfortunately, we can say that uh, as of today, so 10 years after, even though there were campaigns, even though there were a lot of attempts to make um, this, this convention be ratified to become a law, domestic workers still have the same problem. And this has to do with a particular um, political field that in Holland also right now, uh, we can say populist agendas are not also bringing this issue to the fore because it's an unsolvable one for them and it's something that they cannot really burn their hands on that. So it's, it's something that is always relegated. Um, we can also say that um, um, the position of the artists in this, in this particular situation with this, with this work was quite um, a challenge because we had to also find a different language to address this problem. So not only the collaboration with the workers was important and all the factors that you mentioned before about the identity and how you address an identity of a group that is already invisible and blah, blah, but was also to understand that in this case, particularly, authorship was something that has many layers. So we had to work together with many people, with the designer, of course, with the workers. Uh, we had to also leave behind certain uh, wish of doing uh, a particular project. So this, this is what it means to work aligned within a movement, that you have certain responsibilities, certain obligations, and of course, solidarity and collaborations are, 
crucial words for that. Um, I think I can leave it at that and we can already reflect on the following uh, sure. uh, points for our talk. So there are more images of that, okay. I, I don't hear. Do I have muted? Ah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm muted. Sorry. <laughs> I was too excited. I, I just wanted to thank you both for it. It was really exciting to have these two talks uh, parallel to each other. And I'm just wondering before I start to ask some questions, if anyone from the audience has a question to ask, um, or if there are any questions that have landed in our ether pad, which I can't see right now. Um, but if not, oh, no, okay. Oh. Um, so I would just, I, I thought that was quite an interesting parallel to go from the uh, Cisionary struggle um, to then hear about this very sort of successful work that you did with the cleaners unions in the Netherlands. And I'd be curious, um, Kathleen, if you could just talk a little bit more about, so I think this is an important thing to bring up, uh, the function of, of unions and labor struggles, but also their, their massive shortcomings that they have. And I think in particular, for example, in Austria and Germany, and how to work with, um, let's say, seasonal workers, undocumented workers, and then maybe to make the parallel between uh, how it's functioning in Austria, Germany, to, um, to the Netherlands. Uh, it, it, I've just um, opened it up to that to begin with. I mean, I was also thinking about this when I was listening to Matthias and Cecilia. They think one thing that's very important to, to see as a difference, because Matthias also mentioned that for them it's very important also as artists to contribute to building uh, the identity that uh, the Dutch uh, Cleaners Union has and wants to have. And I think with the migrant seasonal work, so even the word seasonal already includes this dilemma, that uh, there, it's not really an identity, you know? <laughs> like the, I think that uh, the situation is uh, that uh, there are different situations of lived precarity in which, uh, especially at least the migrant workers that we are dealing with, not only through Saisonary, but also uh, through UNDOC, and there is another group which is dealing with the 24-hour care workers. So what you see is, for example, the woman who uh, we were now supporting, who stood up for her rights, she's now had enough of agriculture work. She said she doesn't want to go back to working on the field, and now she's considering doing care work. So I think that, there is an identity that uh, you can define in terms of being a migrant seasonal worker, but what you are actually doing, so what this work is, is really depending um, on several conditions, you know, it's depending on the time of year, it's depending on what uh, jobs are available, what contacts you have. So this is also one of the things uh, that's uh, in the framework, also in collaboration with the trade union from Saisonary's side, which poses a huge challenge in terms of organizing, because even though many people work long term in the field of agriculture, so I'm not saying that there are not people who are often working 15, 20, 25 years already in this field but they're doing this seasonally they're constantly in motion and in a way then it's also interesting to think of this uh, question you post for the symposium what system actually so I would also ask like what system are they actually part of I mean obviously they're part of many different systems but they're also a bit like in between these systems in terms of what knowledge they have to negotiate in terms also of availability, for example, for long-term organizing and labor struggles. So this is why actually I found it very interesting also what Matei said about who are the people working in the union. I mean, this is crucial and who are actually the workers they're supporting. And for sure that in the case of seasonal workers in agriculture, none of the trade union people have this background. So you have a very true, and I think it's also a very critical point. You have this kind of bureaucracy of, uh, and administration of the, how trade unions work, especially in social democracy. So that's also why I was kind of already mentioning the anarcho-syndicalist organizing, because I think it has different premises. 
Um, but so there is a kind of gap on many levels between people who are working in the trade union for the rights of, of uh, workers in agriculture and seasonal work and the workers themselves. And one of the gaps is also the language. And that's actually also a gap very often in the activist campaign. So for example, I speak Hungarian, which is great when we meet Hungarian workers on the fields, but if we meet Romanian and Bulgarian workers, then, so this is, I mean, this is obviously, a, it's a general um, challenge. And I think this is also maybe uh, just a bit going back to the question that uh, Oliver posed, which I found uh, very interesting. So to ask, how would we create more egalitarian and more participatory versions of democracy? Because obviously this means that the whole structure of trade unions should be rethought. At least I would say that this is uh, true in this area of work uh, for Austria, but also for other countries, because there is this danger of becoming an empty shell. And maybe one thing that I would like to shortly um, mention, because this is something I experienced myself, and I think a lot of people in migrant positions experience this, um, is the discourse of undeservingness. So very often when you as a migrant worker go to the unemployment office or even to the trade union, so you are not considered, very often there's a discourse that, oh, you haven't been <laughs> investing in this system long enough now if we're defining the system on a nation state level, you know, like in the unemployment office, they will make remarks that you haven't been paying your unemployment uh, or like uh, social security long enough, whatever. So it's I think this uh, already this question of how, like what is this system actually is, is very relevant in, uh, in this context. And undeservingness is I think a very tricky rhetoric, which is unfortunately in migrant struggles, but also refugee struggles, it's returning. And I think it's something that actually the host society or the majority society of uh, different countries has to deal with and has to, has to undo and uh, yeah, for me, it's still a big question. Uh, I, I admire the examples you mentioned regarding the cleaners union because I think it's great examples for long-term organizing, but I'm questioning how to, yeah, how to, how to respond to these challenges within the context of seasonal work and being between systems, so to say. Yeah. Well, at this moment, uh, first of all, I, I, what was really interesting because your last photo um, is completely connected um, with my photos because um, it's part of what you call organizing, organizing as a method, organizing how a method of organizing workers. So it is, um, that has been a new way of um, organizing workers. Uh, it comes from the United States. And then, uh, for example, the film Bread and Roses is a very good example of Ken Lodge. It's a very good example of um, this uh, method of organizing. And then it came to the Netherlands, first to the Netherlands, and now it's also trying to um, enter other uh, unions. But you're right, um, bureaucracy is always a problem if we talk about trade unions. Um, it's really a, the main important question is how to tackle this. At this moment, if you talk about, let's say, the situation in the Netherlands, um, the, um, the cleaners, they, let's say, stopped with the method organizing because they are now reorganized, you could say. Now it is a healthy trade union. A healthy trade union, I call, is a trade union where the workers make a decision and the uh, administrators of the union work for them and they listen to them. Uh, at this moment, there are two new campaigns of the Department of Organizing, and one is the, the so-called Polski Brigade, that is the, Pol uh, the Polish the workers in the Netherlands. So they are not organized by their labor, but more uh, by the country where they come from. And um, uh, this is one of the best, well, best department at this moment uh, is growing, really growing. Another um, um, uh, agriculture workers um, is, uh, has been already for a long time an issue in the Netherlands, um, but it's more or less connected now with 
uh, let's say, all the problems we have now in the corona, uh, what you said, now we get the problems become visible. And for example, we have exactly the same problems what you had in Germany with Tertullius. We have it in the Netherlands. There's only one difference. In the Netherlands, they don't do tests. So we don't know how big the problem is, but it happened already two times that they closed the slaughterhouse completely. And um, if we talk about, let's say, the agriculture workers, it's even more involving the photos you showed of, um, of Romania. We have them, uh, these people, oh no, exactly, it was one company from um, Hungary, and they transported the workers to Eindhoven in the Netherlands. They entered there, and of course, like the, the photos you show where she, you're showing, no protection, no protection <laughs> in a bus altogether, and yeah. they went to work in the fields in the Netherlands, but above all in North Rhine-Westfalen, and we call this the the Asperger's flights. Yeah. We call them. Uh, there has been, of course, it was a bit of kind of schedule, but what you see nowadays, and that is so confronting, that we have, let's say two levels of citizens nowadays in the Netherlands. So on one hand, we have, uh, let's say, the citizens who uh, live and work in the Netherlands. On the other hand, and we, especially we talk about um, the citizens who originally come from the Eastern European countries, from the Eastern part of the European Union, and they officially have the same rights as the, as the people, or let's say the Dutch, or let's say the cleaners in this case, in our, our case. But in fact, um, they don't have. The wages are different. No, the wages are the same. Yeah. But the thing is, there's always a link oh. with housing. So, so also the photos yeah. you showed in the end with housing. Yeah. So there is, um, your employer is directly also your landlord. Yeah. And what you said, four hours a day, we say, oh, that's cheap, because in the Netherlands, they pay more or less four or five hundred uh, a month uh, for their wage. And you have um, the minimum wage is more or less around uh, netto about 1,200, 300, more or less like this. So one third of their wage is directly going to, well, a bat. It looks a little bit better in the Netherlands because there is a bit more control, but it's always a kind of well, exploitation, you could say. Actually, in that case, it's really more visible. The exploitation is really from the employer to them. Yes, but it's quite difficult to get into this uh, because the places where they live they are quite often closed and secured. So it is difficult to enter these yeah. places. Yeah. And officially, there are, the trade union is allowed to enter, but uh, the organizers, they have big problems and also uh, they have to face violence. Um, uh, in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. if they want to get into the place uh, where they live. It's the same situation yeah. here, actually. I mean, you can only, we could only enter this uh, accommodation because we went directly to the worker who had contacted us and she was there and nobody else was there. So, but otherwise it's very difficult. I mean, even entering the fields is uh, an issue. So if the farmer says you cannot enter, you can argue, and it's true that trade unionists should have a right to enter, but very often they just say, I ah, know we take the information material and we will pass it on to our workers. So there are, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is quite a difficult group to organize at this moment because there's, there's a lot of intimidation to the workers. And, uh, but I think this for me, if we talk about labor and Corona is the most shocking thing what went on uh, and became so visible. And um, yeah. this is, then you say, okay, um, are we equal in the Netherlands? No, we are not. No, definitely not. No. Yeah. I'd just like to jump in here because I was thinking again about like the idea of, of artists working in like labor organizing, which some people might think that is like completely not the role of artists, but thinking about the, how important it is to tell stories otherwise right otherwise like it's a different story than the media is going to tell a different story than the governments are going to tell um and just uh what this means for you maybe on a personal level to work on these two on these two levels um let's say from a perspective of, of artistic practice in uh wider social movements yeah, we always say we, we work with one foot inside, one foot outside. So one foot inside the trade union, one foot outside, and it means also connected uh, with art institutions. Um, well, personally, it is, um, it is really nice to work inside the trade union with workers directly uh, because um, workers love art. 
and that is so clear but they have a problem because they reject the the, the art they you can find in museums that is a bit of a problem so they don't consider the art in a museum as part of their culture and um Oh, let's say the 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 Edouard Louis said it really yeah. beautiful. He said one time, I think Edouard it was Louis, you know who the, he the is? writer, the it's French the writer, writer, French writer. He said yeah. it uh, should never be said that the working class reject culture, but rather than culture rejects the working classes, who reject it in in turn. And um, it is his own experience because where Edouard Louis, a writer from working class in the north of France, um, became I think one of the the, the, the leading young voices of literature at this moment so there are also his books are transformed into theater play um because he had a um a, a particular way of writing and also he tells a particular sort of stories uh, about bio his own biography for instance so yeah but it is in working in they uh, they consider let's say us as our artist or the graphic designer as our graphic designers and also what is really interesting also working inside the trade union means also that the authorship um, of the work is completely different because you uh, work more let's say in a collective way so quite often it is not so clear who is the author of the work and that uh, maybe in the beginning as an artist uh, you are teach to become a genius person of course that is sometimes you have to get used to it and also this is where well, yeah, a very trendy word is called word unlearning but it is important you have to unlearn in certain things uh, they taught you and you have to work in a different way yeah, yeah and, and actually you have to sharpen your skills so it's not only about forgetting and unlearning you have to be very specific to see how you can insert your skills in a particular problem with a particular group and in in a language that maybe you know you are not among artists so you have to make an extra effort to construct something together with a new community and and that also makes quite important the relevance of art in society so something that perhaps when i work more in institutional frames is not discussed uh, or not confronted is not clashing well there's one very funny story one time we were making these placades and we were um, um drawing in the in the trade union building for the uh, placards for demonstrations and then uh, the, we allow the cleaners to choose uh, the font and they all were choosing comic sans well if the graphic designer i think there are uh, some graphic designers uh, watching and i think if you say comic sans is horror for a real graphic designer to use comic sans you never do it so our graphic designer was really looking by god comic sans no 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 but they choose it so we use this um a font and then it was for for him it was for money it was really horror in the beginning yeah. but after a while it is something you have to get rid of let's say the visual language you are used to mm -hmm. and and then it becomes if you can play around with it and it becomes fun yeah Kathleen, do you have a last word to add here since we're almost running over time, amazingly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just uh, one thing uh, which uh, kind of takes us back to the, <laughs> from the art to the, to the um, labor question perspective, because I think another thing that was for me a bit disturbing in the discourse on labor during the pandemic is that very often you have this uh, impression that, uh, for example, now let's take Eastern European <laughs> labor workforce, that it's like an inexhaustible resource. So there are like these thousands of people coming, hundreds of people boarding planes and flying to different uh, countries in Western Europe. And I just wanted to make a very important point because uh, I'm working with um, people in rural areas uh, in Hungary, uh, also farmers and land workers. So uh, in, the, in the countries from which these uh, workers are coming, there is a lack of workforce. So there is also like this uh, migration, uh, which is of course a migration uh, for survival. It's a very resilient movement, I would say. 
But nevertheless, uh, in the countries of origin, uh, it's creating huge structural problems, not only in the area of agriculture, but also in uh, other areas. So we also, I think this is also another thing which for me goes in this direction of interdependency, interconnectedness. So to understand like how this chain reactions have re has repercussions. So for example, I know that uh, wine farmers in Hungary have started planting the grape wines differently because they're working with older generation people who cannot lean so much anymore. But I mean, of course, there is a certain, uh, I mean, limit also to flexibility, how you can kind of work around this problematic of uh, structural uh, lack mm -hmm. of workforce. Uh, and this is a very small example and uh, definitely doesn't address uh, the main problem. But also, I mean, there is migrant workforce coming into Hungary from Ukraine, from Romania. But so it's, I think this is another important aspect that, of course, there are always the more precarious who will even go to the poorer Eastern European countries to work. But uh, it's, uh, it's something that's often not considered in terms of also the inequality within this uh, European uh, system. Or, context. <laughs> so that's hey. it, I know. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, I'm sure we could do an entire symposium on labor conditions, but uh, this was a great start opening to uh, the rest of the two days here. And yeah, so I think we have a break now for about 10 minutes, I believe, before we start the next uh, panel. And so <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. And um, oh, somebody wrote a, something, a comment, different issue, but also labor related university workers also organizing Castle against temporary contracts. Okay. True. Thanks for the interesting talks written <laughs> in the comment section. So thank you yes. so much. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. 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 So um, I'm Lorena and I'll be moderating, but I don't call it actually moderating because it will be more in the mood of a talk. Uh, and I'm very glad uh, this next session that's called, that will be called Turning Echoes because uh, the initiative that we invited to be part of this session is ECHO. That's a collective experiment by Oficina de Imaginação Política, Criti Critical and Creative Social Justice Cluster uh, at UBC and Living Commons Collective. And it's designed, organized, and curated by Denise Ferreira da Silva, Valentina Desideri, and Amil Packer. ECHO is a multi-layered and multidisciplinary forum that encourages and facilitates transnational solidarity through material redistribution in the spirit of reparation and not charity. I'm very glad to welcome here Amilcar Paque. Amilcar was born in Santiago de Chile and he lives between Sao Paulo and Vancouver. And among many other things, he's the father of a keen artist, curator, organizer, translator, and it's a very important person in my formation as well as critical researcher. So uh, I'll leave space for you, Amilcar, to explain and to bring us what's about ECHO and to show us something about what this platform, as you call. Thank you for being with us. <clears throat> thank you, Lorena, and thank you all for being here today. Um, it's a huge defy for me. Uh, this condition, uh, and mostly because for already more than a decade, more most of the things that I'm involved with uh, are related to uh, create devices, situations, or just excuses for people to gather to meet and discuss and produce and, and invent and experiment practice together. Uh, so the, the actual context of the pandemic uh, doesn't allow us to be in this kind of situation. <clears throat> and it's a pity. Uh, also because usually I like to talk, look into the face of people, to the eyes, to see the responses. So it's a huge divide. 
uh, well, um, I'm gonna just start showing you something without saying anything. Um, and then we are gonna talk a little bit. E caboclo índio ajoelhado na jurema, pedindo forças para Deus lhe ajudar. Caboclo índio ajoelhado na jurema, pedindo forças para Deus lhe ajudar. Bom dia, boa noite, meus irmãos, meus camaradas, companheiro de jornada, não negam seu natural. Ele é caboclo e de lindo chega a brilhar. É filho da jurema e da raiz do Oruca. De manhãzinha quando amanhece, é nessa hora que ajoelho e vou rezar. De manhãzinha quando amanhece, é nessa hora que ajoelho e vou rezar. Olho pro céu e dou meu grito, graças a Deus por ter nascido índio. E graças a Deus por ter nascido índio. O sol nasceu na serra, é nessa hora que ajoelho e vou rezar. O sol nasceu na serra, é nessa hora que ajoelho e vou rezar. Olho pro céu e dou meu grito, graças a Deus por ter nascido índio. E graças a Deus por ter nascido índio. E o sol nasceu na serra, é nessa hora que ajoelho e vou rezar. O sol nasceu na serra, é nessa hora que ajoelho e vou rezar. Olho pro céu e dou meu grito, graças a Deus por ter nascido índio. E graças a Deus por ter nascido índio. O oh, que acabou. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I hope you all could watch and uh, hear Rafael praying, singing. Uh, anyway, this is one of the contributions which are present on the platform uh, ECO. Uh, if I'm not wrong, the the website is is on the description of the of our uh conversation anyway i'm gonna put it here so anyone can go there and check it uh, <clears throat> so uh echo uh, as as valentina uh, as as lorena was uh, presenting in the beginning is a collective experiment and we are sorry that because of, of jet lags and things like this, uh, Denise, which is in Canada, cannot participate today. And also Valentina Desideri, which is in Lisbon, and she's in quarantine uh, now. Uh, she couldn't have uh, proper access. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have the, the, the hard responsibility to do the presentation only myself. Uh, I've been working with uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva and Valentina for a couple of years now, and uh, most of what we have been doing is related to what I was mentioning about creating platforms, situations, context to critically gather together for effective and research initiatives, then. mostly in Brazil and, and mostly also in the city of Sao Paulo. Uh, ECHO, which is this platform that I am presenting for you today, uh, was, so to say, it emerged from uh, our huge concern relating the, 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 the severe effects of the COVID pandemic uh, within the, the whole world, but more specifically within the context of Brazil that was already suffering for <clears throat> a couple of years of the intensification of the colonial structures that uh, are part of the invention of, of the Brazil as a nation state. Yeah? Uh, 
Uh, as you might know, nowadays, uh, Brazil is the second country most affected uh, after the US. And of course, <clears throat> uh, nobody needed to be a specialist, a virologist or whatever, or a futurologist to know that. And also to know that the most affected uh, individuals and communities will be the racialized and economi economically dispossessed. So early in the beginning of the pandemic, in the beginning of the quarantine, we started conversing about what could we do regarding what was going on and what we already knew at that time, mid-March, that was going to happen. <clears throat> and we started to think about this platform that um, basically, as you can see online, uh, presents artistic and other practices uh, mainly not exclusively but mainly from practitioners uh, <clears throat> uh, located in, in in brazil in the nation state and also which are uh, directly implicated in these choreographies of of uh, of the, this colonial and capital choreographies no connected to social, gender, and economical violence that uh, is really much in, uh, highlighted or in intensified <clears throat> during the period of the COVID. Yeah? So the idea uh, is to create this platform uh, to provide the material and so to say symbolic or conceptual conditions uh, to host, archive uh, these practices these contributions, contributions, but as well to function. I'm sorry, there's someone with an open mic that's making some, some noise. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was, as, as, as I was saying, uh, we had this, so to say, double or simultaneous uh, drive, which was to um, archive, share, distribute practices, and also at the same time create the material and conceptual conditions for these practitioners or collectives or collectivities or communities, uh, not only to share what they do, but also uh, to, to, to have some, some access to, to financial uh, uh, conditions to pay basic things, but also to somehow dynamize uh, some of their uh, community uh, uh, implicated work, so to say. Uh, this means in the case of, of the video that I showed you of Rafael, Rafael is part of an open collectivity from the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil. Uh, more specifically in the city of Poços de Caldas. <clears throat> and it's a collective called Estamos Aqui, Experiências Negras e Usos da Cidade, which English could be translated as mostly, or as we are here, uh, Black Experiences and Uses of the City, which has been crossing Afro-Brazilian uh, uh, um, so to say spiritual practices uh, connected to music a lot in the city of, of Poços de Caldas, south of the state of Minas Gerais and uh, video production, you know? So for instance, uh, Estamos Aqui is one of what we call in ECHO host uh, alliances. No? This means that we work in a mid to long term way with them. So we are having like continuous contributions with them. Uh, and so we work together with them in a mid to long term. We are, we have so far four of these hosted uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, I'm gonna um, talk about this one, but you can see also in the website, there's another one called Shama, which is mainly a radio organizing in, in the state of Pernambuco, mostly in the city of Recife, by artist Ana Lira and some other artists there. Uh, and there are two other initiatives that are gonna still be 
featured in the platform in, at, at, in the website. But anyway, what uh, for us was very interesting, uh, um, connected to collaborating with Estamos Aqui, and that's why I wanted to start the presentation, is because, uh, like for instance, Rafael, which is the, 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 the artist singer that showed you, that, that was singing for us here, and uh, I don't know, maybe most of you couldn't read what was written in Portuguese, King uh, Reza, uh, Canta quem canta reza duas vezes, which means something like, can be translated by who prays sings, who sings prays twice. Rafael, during the pandemic, has been his uh, 20, yeah, his 20 or 21, I don't recall exactly now. Uh, he's one of, of the persons that has been during the whole pandemic working. He's working with, with, with what is called essential services. He's working in a supermarket, mainly helping people to pack groceries and things like this. And uh, it's very, I, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know where most of you are, so it's, it's hard to say, but I think that this is a global experience that most of the people connected to what has been called essential service are also uh, tasks that are executed by, so to say, disposable bo bodies. Uh, I mean that uh, even though uh, it has been used, uh, the, 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 the adjective essential to talk about these services, uh, the persons, the individual that has been doing these jobs or that are, are performing this labor, uh, this people are reduced mainly to their uh, labor force and are in that sense disposable individuals. No? <clears throat> so we see how even though the novel coronavirus and, uh, and the pandemic that it caused uh, is, uh, brings uh, or highlights not so, it's not so novel, no? it's not so new what it entangles, what it implicates. And in that sense, for us, it was very relevant to understand that uh, um, the idea of novel uh, connected to the novel coronavirus, it's also some kind of inscription so in the sense of a text. And we were thinking how the novel coronavirus, the idea of using the idea of novel also provide us to think about how the pandemic is part or is being conjugated to the what, we, what can be called the modern text, you know, the colonial, uh, uh, the colonial capital text, and how this has been, be, how this became clear, on on how the 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 rate of of lethality of the virus is uh, is uh, exponentially increased in in racialized and also disp economically dispossessed communities. In the case of Brazil. This, me, this means may, mainly uh, uh, black communities, but also indigenous communities. And um, I don't know if any of you are following what's happening in here, but it's, it's, it's a catastrophe, it's terrible, and it's not only terrible for Brazil, I would say that it's, it's terrible for the whole planet. Uh, there's more than 500 indigenous people that ha have already died so far, and these are uh, official numbers uh, from children to elderly and uh, 500 is a huge, huge, huge number for those communities. And the world is losing like uh, uh, people which are really, really, really uh, valuable and that are the, uh, that uh, they have knowledge that these are disappearing. No, it's, it's people, that are being uh, uh, killed um, because, like, the virus uh, uh, cannot not be separated for, or at least for us, no, the the the, the virus cannot be separated of, of this whole racial racial violence. <clears throat> uh, so it's not only people in the sense of individuals, but whole communities that are threat. No, that they're 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 they're. they're modes of the existence. So uh, one of the things that we have been, tr have been trying to think about is how uh, those individuals, communities, collectivities, they, 
they they carry in them uh, uh, not only practices but worlds so just like one simple example i, I think that it's since last year at least uh, there's a lot of of uh, uh, discussions about how the new brazilian government is threatening the environment and the forest uh, and uh, recently there has been a huge pressure on the Brazilian government by international global uh, financists and also Brazilian financists about the conservation of the forest and mainly people talk about the Amazon forest they forget that there is the the Mata Atlantica the Atlantic rainforest which is really 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 very important as well but anyway uh, the thing is that it's in in few cases, there is made the link between the conservation of the po of the forest or uh, <clears throat> and uh, the people that live in the forest. So the thing is that uh, while the people uh, that live in the forest are not granted with their rights, uh, there is no possibility that the forest will be uh, uh, um, uh, preserved, protected, or conservated. So uh, just to give this example to tell how we believe uh, uh, that uh, ECHO can provide uh, by being a minimal, a very small gesture, a very really, uh, it's a very, 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 very tiny gesture uh, to help, <clears throat> may, to maybe help to contribute uh, to keep alive people, uh, communities and their practices understanding that uh, we cannot separate the practice from the people that do the practice. So there's no culture without people, there's no art without the people, there's no forest without the people. So uh, also the whole platform, as also Lorena was mentioning in the beginning, is, uh, has, uh, is a strategy to, to, to strengthen and or to invite for uh, transnational solidarity. So one of the things that we made is that for each contribution, there's a link to support either the, act, the artist, the collective, or a suggested initiative by the artists of the collectives. Also to provide uh, with the possibility that there might be some direct uh, 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 support, alliance, or share uh, in the terms of financial means. We uh, have very, very few <laughs> financial uh, means, that, so we pay uh, in that sense for each contribution and for the hosted initiatives, uh, as I was mentioning, we work with a, a, a bigger fee, so to say, uh, to be able to do a continuous work with them. Uh, but it's also very relevant that the other people or initiatives or foundation can also directly contact or directly help those artists, uh, collectives or communities. Again, uh, for instance, in the case of Estamos Aqui, during the, the launch of ECHO, we provided with the possibility of doing a live performance. This live performance, uh, beyond the fees uh, that we paid and, and the technical things that we covered, allowed them to gather around what is, is still very little, like, I mean, it's 150 euros, which means uh, here in Brazil, seven or 800 uh, reais, but this allowed the distribution of, of food for a lot, a lot, a lot of people. So, also, Anufra, uh, let me interrupt you quickly yes. because we are almost running out of time. Okay. And I would like to ask you something in regard of what we talked previously, because I think it's a very interesting point to the whole session about how are we talking about restitution and not charity, because I think it makes <clears throat> a lot of sense to the point that we're raising of what kind of system are we trying to create or are we within. So if you could just bring this question as well, I think it would be very interesting for the audience. Of course, um, one of the key elements of what I've been doing also in the late, late decades is the possibility to converse and we don't have so much, but anyway. So one of the key questions for us uh, when everything started is uh, art 
for whom uh, 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 and what what it can do. No, so we also believe that what we call artistic practice can be also defined by political imagination, and this is pretty much connected <clears throat> to the these ideas that uh, uh, Lorena was mentioning about restitution. Restitution uh, uh, is is connected also to material means, so uh, so money, of course. So providing the, 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 the possibilities for those artists, collectives, collectivities to produce things, uh, but also to pay their rents, <laughs> the ba basic, basic needs in a country that doesn't, doesn't allow these possibilities for most of the people. And, and for the artistic, I mean, for instance, for you to say, uh, to see Estemos Aqui or Rafael, they are not even considered artists by their communities. Tam? Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, we see with ECHO the possibility to, to, to dynamize processes of, of restitution in the sense of amplifying voices which are already there, yeah? but also to provide this with this understanding that there's no art without the people that make art. And if this, and if this people if those communities are in threat, there's no meaning about talking about their practice. No, if we don't provide the minimum conditions for those people uh, to exist, and exist means being able to pay their rents, to buy food, but also to exist as as living beings. So being able to do what they do. No? <laughs> so it's not charity at all. No? Thank you, dear. Um, so I think that we can open perhaps for questions if someone wants to either in Etherpad or here in the Zoom group chat or I don't know, in the microphone as you wish, but uh, if the audience mm. has questions. While some might be formulating the questions, uh, I, I wanted also to explain to you, most of the website is so far in Portuguese, but it's been already translated to English, so you can check there. Uh, the website also features a film by Denise Ferreira da Silva and Arjuna Newman, Serpent Train, which is gonna be showed tomorrow. I don't remember, uh, uh, Lorena can also tell you the proper uh, time for it. Uh, all the contributions from artists and collectives which are in the website have keywords. Those keywords, they provide the possibility to create what we call constellations. So you can research the website by clicking on the keywords and there's a whole different organization of the material that's gonna be uh, provided by this, uh, as I was mentioning, we see ECHO as some kind of archive of, of research as well. We see these practices as, as people which are also doing research. Anyway, please check the website. There's a lot of material already and uh, we're feature <clears throat> we we we're featuring continuously uh, work. There's a, a contribution which is going to be featured this Sunday by artist Mogli Saura, which is an anti-clip of, of, uh, of fake funk. So I invite you to check there. And if by any chance you have other questions, don't hesitate uh, to contact by the website or you can have, I'm going to put my email here, or... Lorena? I saw, oh, Lorena. I saw a question in the etherpad. Um, oh, can you, can you read it, please? Yeah. There, someone asked, could you elaborate more on restitution in a non-materialistic sense? <clears throat> uh, Probably we're not going to have, uh, thank you for the question, probably we're not going to have time enough, but of course, when we talk about restitution, uh, we're talking about, for instance, in the formulation of Denise Ferreira da Silva, the colonization as the restitution or the return uh, of, of indigenous land and of the total uh, value produced by 
enslaved and, and subjugated and subalternized bodies along the, 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 the history of more of 500 years, but uh, uh, which implicates as well, for instance, questions related to knowledge production, epistemology, uh, access to institutions, access to language, to the hermeneutics of language, to the legitimation, uh, to legitimizing space of art, of contemporary art. So, uh, ah, now I see the question. So, uh, when we're talking also about the restitution, uh, it has several of, of non-material, so to say. Uh, I don't like also this opposition between material and material, but anyway, it, as a default way of, of, of putting things. But uh, it is also a continuous work with uh, those and other practitioners related to distribute uh, my or our access to these hermeneutics, to these uh, 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 accesses to institutions, to language, uh, uh, and to, to provide the possibility to, to other epistemologies to emerge, you know, to rise. Um, I, don't, I don't know if this helps. <laughs> In another moment, uh, if the person that made the question want to contact to talk more about it, I'm up for it. There's another question. Yeah, this can be the last one. Otherwise, we won't have time for a pause. And but I, I think it would be nice if you can answer this one, Amilcar. You talk about artistic <clears throat> practice as political imagination. Can you just say a few words about this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's also hard for me to synthesize, uh, but that, that's very personal. Uh, but anyway, uh, by political imagination uh, is a way that I've been using to, to refer to as we call art uh, or art, artistic practices, which is of course uh, implicated with what we usually talk about political issues, but is not in the sense of um, uh, of official politics or necessarily the, the official institutionalized institution of, of politics, but also to think about matters that really defy us collectively. You know? So questions related, for instance, to uh, prison abolitionism or punitivism, or thinking how those questions or processes of racialization and, uh, or things like, I'm just gonna give a, a, a uh, an image that I like to talk about is like, for instance, if we want uh, to stop building walls, we should maybe stop uh, uh, making uh, frame it paintings because it's the frame it paintings that uh, uh, somehow they require the, the, the screws uh, that require the, the walls. So it's connected to think uh, somehow how our, our practices are, are supporting uh, uh, these structures that we are trying to uh, fight against and make collapse. Hey, I'm Yuka. Thank you so much for being with us. Perhaps you can share with us as well some of your material that I know that you produce for the biennial and if it's in English, it's better because it's more accessible, but I think you produce a lot of books and publications yes. that can be also very interesting for the audience. And I can, I thank I, you. I can, yeah. that. I, can, yeah. I can share with you some material regarding uh, Oficina de Imaginação Política, for instance, which is in English. It's mostly connected with, with what we did in the Sao Paulo Biennial of 2016. So there's a lot of things that we did since then, like ECHO, but I, I, I guess it can also help you to uh, figure out a little bit more. I thank okay. you very much for the, uh, for the opportunity to share with you this, and good luck with the continuation of the seminar. That's lovely to have you with us. Thank you a lot, Amilcar. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Hello and welcome, and thank you all for agreeing to join us in this conversation, uh, which was maybe sort of 
uh, going a little blast from the past there, I guess, <laughs> when we asked you. And uh, thanks to everybody. I, don't, I hope everyone is back from the break now. And we are going to start with the panel discussion entitled, Who's Award Actually? Uh, which was uh, David's actually great idea to, um, let's, I'll just start, I'll read my short introduction and then uh, I think the conversation will unfold itself. But So um, before the award ceremony of the 2017 Prize de Nacional Gallery, the four nominated artists, Sol Calero, Iman Issa, Juman Mana, and Agnieszka Polska published an open letter calling attention to, quote, three problematic aspects of the prize, which they found indicative of broader and growing trends in the art field, and therefore deserving of public ear. And I have prepared an introduction with the problematic areas, but since Jumana has agreed to read the letter, I will skip that. And I'll just give a quick introduction to three of the four uh, nominees from the 2017 Prize to National Gallery. We have with us uh, Iman Issa, who is an artist and professor at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. And like all of the artists on the panel, her work has been exhibited widely and on an international scale, including at the MoMA and the Guggenheim Museums in New York City, MACPA in Barcelona, and many other places. Uh, she has won several awards and was a 2017 GAD Artist in Residence in Berlin. And Jumana Mana is a visual artist working primarily with film and sculpture, exploring how power is articulated, the relationships often focusing on the body and materiality in relation to narratives of nationalism and histories of place. And her work has been shown at institutions like the Jus des Pommes in Paris, the Henny Onstad Museum in Norway, and the Marrakesh and Venice Biennials, and in several international film festivals, including the Berlinale and CPH Docs. And Agnieszka Polska uh, positions her computer-based, uh, sorry, I can't even read anymore, <laughs> positions her computer-generated media works in an intricate relationship between language, science, and history, using them to focus on the individual and social responsibilities. In her work, she attempts to describe the overwhelming ethical ambiguity of our time by poetic means and the relationships between individuals and their surroundings by constantly shifting the narrative through different scales. Her work has been shown in many exhibitions internationally, including the 57th Venice Biennial, and she was awarded the prize to the National Gallery in 2017. So thank you all very much. And uh, David, do you want to say anything? Or perhaps we could start by reading the letter that you wrote in 2017. Um, yeah, I would just say welcome. Um, we are glad that you made it here. And I think it's a good idea to start with reading letter because uh, I guess not everyone is familiar with that letter. Okay. But it is important. So uh, would you just start reading uh, the first um, paragraph? Yeah. Uh, and Yeshka and Iman, I could start by reading the first paragraph, but I just wanted to ask what, what do you think is a good way to each read a paragraph and stop to talk in between, or shall we read it kind of all and then talk? I think we should uh, discuss each paragraph mm -hmm. just to reflect on it, because otherwise it, it ventures in too many directions at the same time. That would be my... Uh, also, yeah, yeah I, th I think that we can, like, each of us can read one paragraph and then we can discuss basically... Uh, how these three years affected, I don't know, our views on what we wrote, or what we wrote uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, if like any perspectives uh, shifted from, from that time, I think that it's uh, uh, because we also, even though we became friends after uh, this event, I think that we rarely talk about our statement. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, um, I, I could begin um, with the first one. So our letter was uh, published on November 9th, 2017. Um, Angie, you read this part. So as the four, four shortlisted nominees of the Prize de National Gallery, we have decided to release a joint statement concerning our experience. Our statement is, means, is a means to highlight and recommend changes to three problematic aspects of the prize 
which we find indicative of broader and growing trends in the art field, and therefore deserving of a public year. Number one, the Preis de Nationale Galerie, hosted by the Hamburger Bahnhof, uh, is a joint venture between the Nas National Galerie of the Staatliche Museen and Freunden der Nationale Galerie, with BMW as its main sponsor. We take at face value the intention of this prize to be to support and give voice to serious artistic positions and practices based in Germany. With this in mind, we have been troubled by the constant emphasis in press releases and public speeches on our gender and nationalities, rather than the content of our work. It is clear to us that in a more egalitarian world, the fact of our gender and national origin would be barely noticed. Having it constantly emphasized can only be indicative of how far we are from such an egalitarian world. Furthermore, the self-congratulatory self use of diversity as a public relations tool risks masking the very serious systemic inequalities which continue to persist at all levels of our field. We would like to stress that commitments to diversity in gender, race, and experience need to be built into the everyday operations of institutions and organizations, rather than celebrated occasionally at high profile events. Thank you so much. I, reading this letter again, and in, in particular reading this first uh, paragraph, I had to just uh, think about the current events right now, and particularly I'm thinking now in the United States, everything that's happened since the murder of George Floyd, and particularly in the art world, which has, has really uh, led to uh, art institutions trying yet again to uh, change their structures. And uh, so I'm just curious to hear then from, from you now what you think about this paragraph. Uh. Maybe I will just, maybe I will start. Uh, I, will just, I, I just want to say that uh, basically this paragraph which uh, uh, mm, which basically talks about the virtue signaling and uh, this um, uh, kind of progressiveness that is um, uh, that is declared by the institutions uh, is is very prevalent uh, today with like in many different aspects especially like as you said when you think about the, uh, about the like everything that was happening recently in the United States and uh, also, not only in the in the context of uh, contemporary visual art, but uh, in culture in, in general, I, I think that uh, there is a lot of uh, capitalization uh, on the uh, basically on diversity, and diversity is used as a uh, as a way to uh, to to show the progressiveness of, of an institution uh, while there is uh, there, there are no uh, uh, changes in the structure uh, which of course is the uh, main way to uh, to fight for the diversity so I think that the, this uh, this paragraph only gained on the value during these three years and I think that it's very important to um, to know that there is a like a very big uh, that that basically we have to escape this uh, trap of um, uh, of capitalizing of on uh, um, like declared progressiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean it. This kind of what we experienced at the time, if I remember correctly, is that uh, almost in every statement that was written about our group, kind of in the first announcement of the nominees, but also later for the ceremony and all the press releases, um, the fact that we were kind of um, from different backgrounds was the first thing that was written, and sometimes without there being any comments on what we actually do or what project we're actually showing, but this constant fronting of our identity and particularly our identity as non, 
European or non-Central European, at least, um, women. Um, and, and so it became kind of like a, a very short-handed way exactly to, to show diversity without there being a real engagement. It felt like a tokenization of who we are rather than what we're doing and what we're offering um, as, as artists. Iman, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think, um, I mean, for me, I understand this um, impetus because, of course, institutions want to uh, feel like, you know, they look at their, uh, let's say, constituency or their collections and realize they're really uh, coming from very, um, let's say, <laughs> monochrome or like um, <clears throat> the same kind of uh, sectors and they, um, and they, um, there is a kind of need to, to change that. Um, but uh, yeah, to me, this um, it's very clear that um, uh, you know approaching um, works only from um, the aspect of representation is a very reactionary and not a very uh, let's say profound way to think of uh, of the situation. Um, so uh, yeah, I I think when I think back to this paragraph, I do agree. With, with both Agnieszka and Germana that it is, it seems even more relevant. Um, and maybe the George Floyd um, demonstrations are a good example because, you know, one way to, to or maybe a, a way to speak about these things in the past would have been to speak about, you know, the racism of the police and how to mend that and how to make the police less racist. But the most inspiring for me thing for me with these demonstrations was a, a slogan like abolish the police or defund the police. So actually rework the entire parameter and structure. If you really want to deal with it, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, um, let's say making the police like more diverse or, or window dressing. It's, it's something that I think is more profound and takes a lot more um, work and, and goes a lot deeper, yeah. Mm -hmm. David, do you have any questions? Otherwise, I might. I have one more. One more thing I wanted to ask before we move on to the next paragraph of the letter. And it's just briefly, and maybe I, maybe I shouldn't just interrupt our conversation. But I was thinking in this sense of of the sort of the conflict between perhaps the jury, who chose all four of you for a particular reason, perhaps. The fact that they wanted to make a point that, um, uh, let's say, or to, to have a different pool of finalists for this prize who are not exactly the stereotypical German white male. Um, and at the same time, then, the, the problematic part of the prize structure itself. And so I was just curious if you, if you could, uh, you know, how of these, if there was some sort of conflict of, uh, yeah, good intentions, which then <laughs> ended up serving as this kind of a superficial, uh, yeah, front for deeper structural issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't think the jurors necessarily who selected us uh, were aware that we would be like, you know, that it would necessarily end up being four women, as far as what we understood, but. We weren't obviously there, and this is all kind of, I don't know, it's maybe risky to um, try to judge on kind of secondhand information, but it's, I mean, how the jurors were even selected is part of how we got selected. So the jurors themselves were, I think, also primarily women and maybe also women of like different backgrounds. So, um, so clearly there was an intent like uh, in the institution to kind of diversify. Um, and yeah, I think as you've kind of insinuated in your question that that, that didn't really match the whole um, economic structure, corporate structure, um, and institutional kind of patriarchal structure of the, of, of the prize and how it was conducted and what gets prioritized in the process, um, where the money is spent, where it's not spent, um, and so on. So, so yeah, clearly it's not, you know, um, we, there, I, don't, I, I don't think any of us felt used by the jurors. On the contrary, of course, it's very flattering to be selected and nominated for the prize, but it was, it was everything around it, exactly of how, how that ended up playing out. 
I just I just want to yeah say something in reference to to what Jumana just said that uh, it's kind of interesting to see how also uh, there is already a visible need for the institution to to change and to to change its structure, but like different fields and different uh, branches uh, or levels of the institution are develop developing in a uh, at a different pace. Uh, so, for example, there was a, what, what Jumana mentioned that uh, I think that it, for sure uh, the first jury that uh, nominated us uh, was already chosen, not uh, for sure, not uh, with an idea that uh, eventually there would be only four women in the, uh, in the competition. Uh, but uh, of course, these were curators that already had a, like an established. Uh, practice uh, that was uh, very uh, diversity inclusive and uh, but then there are other structures of, of the institution that kind of uh, didn't follow up and I think that uh, this only shows how difficult it is to uh, restructurize an institution that is as big as uh, the National Gallery, uh, because it's not only it's not only even like like a new vision of, of an institution. It is a it is a change that uh, that may take like many years, and it is basically a change that uh, that happen, that starts in the uh, in the visitors of the museum. So I think that. Uh, it, it is kind of interesting to see how this process is uh, started, but then uh, it is just uh, like not every everything is uh, happening at the same pace. Um, I would have a question that uh, could be connected uh, to what you just said, because uh, with an interview uh, by Cornelia Solfrank, a key figure of the early cyber feminism movement in mind, um, which I listened to uh, um, just a few weeks ago. Uh, she was um, talking about the feminist art movement at the end of the 60s and early 70s and the fact that uh, these artists were totally ignored, but 40 years later they are, you know, um, highlighted everywhere, shown everywhere. And I was wondering uh, if that open form of ignorance uh, back then transformed in a strange way that you today have still forms of ignorance uh, like the one that you um, uh, went through during that crisis but at the same time uh, you're not um, you know ignored um, uh, in that very same way as before, it's in a more way more subtle way, you know, uh, you are there, you are shown off, but um, your work as artists has been ignored. And that's a strange development. Um, and uh, do you see something like this? Do you? Um, what do you think about maybe that? Maybe you can define uh, a bit uh, what you mean by ignored. You mean like, because what we said, I mean, obviously we wrote this because we found it troubling uh, to, to the reception of the work. And I mean, in the end, that was, I think, our, or at least, I, I mean, if I don't speak for everyone, you can correct me, but that's my feeling that um, at least for me, it was, yeah, it was a troubling aspect. But uh, it has to do with the capitalizing on, on an aspect. And, and uh, you know, in most institutions, this is also a, a normal structure of institutions. It's very hard not to, in our system, like the way everything is working, not to find things to capitalize on. Sometimes that is the content of the work. At other times, it could be, you know, like uh, where the artist is from or like whether they're women or whether they're not, you know. So it, it, I think it has to do with this idea of what to capitalize on and what it does to the um, to the work I guess that you're doing um, whether there is a space where you 
you know, where you have this kind of mutual ability to not capitalize on any aspects. I mean, I don't know if that really exists in institutions as we, um, as we know them. Um, but also, I think with your question, there is always the implication that institutions are these, you know, they're kind of these power centric, dominated by a very particular sector. And we're always trying to, you know, to convince that sector to give us more space, or we're trying to, uh, let's say, um, you know, tell them that actually, oh, you're doing it all wrong. But I think real change means that you need to completely change that structure and not just like speak to it from uh, this kind of powerless position of, of wanting more recognition or wanting a different kind of recognition. So I think, I mean, for me, I think the spirit of the letter was really to kind of share an experience in the hope that things could, um, you know, that maybe the artists who come, who are like coming after us or other artists or we ourselves in other situations could find the tools by which to handle this uh, differently. Yeah. Maybe that brings us to the next paragraph of the letter. Somebody, I don't know who wants to read that one. Ivan, do you want to be the next one? Or? Uh, sure, I don't mind, yeah. I can, uh... okay, so number two. Um, the award ceremony of the Prize der National Gallery seemed to be more of a celebration of the sponsors and institutions than a moment to engage with the artists and their work. The award was announced at the end of numerous speeches and performances in what can only be described as a great unveiling. A solution to this would be to announce the winner prior to the ceremony and let the ceremony be a chance to celebrate and give voice to the winning artists and engage with their practice. Some conventions that might function in the corporate and entertainment industries seem out of place when applied to the field of art. The award doesn't need to be structured in a manner that implies a sense of competition between people who are not in fact competing. Structuring it in this manner results in the fabrication of obstacles to solidarity, collectivity and mutual support among artists. So this to me seems to be kind of a key point, which I know that we were very interested in because it is exactly this, this sort of, um, let's say contradiction, great contradiction that exists within, within the field of art, this notion that of success and yet solidarity, uh, which is, I would say, in this, the whole prize structure, and this is only one prize of many prizes that exist. So it's, it's a structure that is quite prevalent in the field of art. And how do we think about, how do we think about this or how do we move out of it? Because um, on the one hand, I mean, prizes give um, these artists that win them, and I mean, not in your case, unfortunately, but often uh, the chance to then be able to work, you know, it gives them some sort of uh, monetary support for a while. Um, but uh, as David noted, it also creates a lot of quote unquote losers. And so I'd be really quite curious to hear your perspectives on this uh, in relation to this prize and also generally. Um, I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking as, as, as you were speaking, Angie, like, um, yeah, I think I, there definitely is this kind of contradiction or hypocrisy within the art field is that there is, there is kind of, um, traction to certain terms that, that are political, like solidarity and struggle and resistance and all of these things. But it's often, again, in the representational mode, what Iman was talking about earlier. Um, so long, as long as it never really threatens the structures of the art world that are so much based on an individuated structure where the artist is a figure. Um, and I've experienced this when I've tried to work collaboratively with other artists, the system doesn't know how to deal with it. They're constantly asking, but whose work is this? You know, is it yours or you, were you the director or were you the sculpt? Like they need to kind of formulate things and, and actually the system is not used to having, um, collective structures within it that that challenge is kind of hyper individuated model of the artist that's kind of like a business figure that has a um that has a certain signature and a certain style that that the market wants to come you know continue buying that style of so um so i think that the kind of this the, 
the way that the, pri the prize is modeled, and again, this idea of competition only feeds into that structure and into that kind of um, the singular artist. That, um, yeah, so that's, that's just what I was thinking when you were speaking. I mean, I, I uh, kind of understand this uh, argument, although personally, I always feel that there is a big uh, difference between this idea of the singular artist. Like, I, I, I do believe there is a, a world that could exist in which this figure of this artist is this lone figure um, who works and can still exist in a society and can still be part of a, a collective and can still, even if the work comes from like a singular, let's say, psyche or a singular uh, space, it doesn't necessarily mean that you enter the world and engage in social relations and in political relations only in this kind of self-interested manner. And I think this kind of engagement in the self-interested manner has to do with a much larger system that is outside of the world and it even goes into political struggles today like we always hear this idea of like you know you know these are the people fighting this cause and these are their allies with their white allies or like mm -hmm. but what the, i never understand this because it always means like i only care about the issues that concern me so if i'm an egyptian woman i only care about things that have to do with egypt and being a woman but that's not a political relationship to the world and it's not a social relationship to the world. I could be an individual who's an Egyptian woman, but I, when I enter relations, I could enter them in a collective manner and I can work with other people. So it's not to me this idea of the individual artist, not necessarily a contradiction to the fact that, you know, we can enter this prize and Agnieszka, Sol and Juman and myself, we can become friends and we can think together about how to make the situation better for everyone. So, um, yeah. Mm. So there's space, um, there's space for both is kind of what you were saying, Iman, of like kind of operating as an individual artist, but also operating in, operating in collectivity, that one doesn't need to... I think that the, the space of the, you know, the creative figure could be one or could be several, mm -hmm. but I think to me the big problem is this idea of self-interest, that whether, you know, that, that everything has to do with my self-interest, so even if I operate, let's say, based on my identity, and even if that's a collective, like all Egyptian women, it's still about, I'm only operating with self-interest, and to me this is really the key problem this is the fact that i find very uh, problematic and this is the real obstacle to solidarity because i think you can be you know uh, you can you know make work as yourself or you can make it part of a collective but i don't think actually that's the the big difference you can be a collective and still be operating with this self-interest when you operate in in the system and in the world so uh, to me the, this point is what needs to change and what I found really inspiring, you know, was the ability that we all work together to think about the whole structure. And it wasn't about, you know, what each of us could get out of it. And, and that, as, as a model, is something I, I find very inspiring. And it's hard to come across, um, not just in art, but um, I think outside as well. I, I think that's also the... Uh what actually allowed us to collaborate uh, uh, on this statement and during the course of the uh, of the uh, exhibition uh, was uh, the idea that we shared that uh, we basically enter a system that is uh, outdated that we enter something that was uh, maybe referring to the like the star artists from the 90s and that we just don't belong to this system anymore and that uh, basically uh, this needs to be updated and uh, it is based on some uh, ridiculous, uh, absolutely fake uh, ideas on how a uh, contemporary uh, artist uh, uh, is thinking and uh, how they work and how they, uh, uh, how they earn money and uh, basically um, on this idea of this uh, individual uh, star. Uh, and I think that uh, we immediately thought that, uh, that a collaboration would be actually something that, uh, I mean, like uh, during the course of, uh, like when we shared uh, some, same concerns, we, uh, we understood that actually a collaboration is a good way to, um, uh, to discuss this situation and, uh, what I just want to mention 
uh, also in regard to this uh, particular uh, paragraph is that uh, it is also very very difficult to discuss the very idea of the uh, competition because uh, the competition is something that uh, a young artist encounters at the very beginning of uh, like even their studies uh, i mean an artist is uh, not invited to the university uh, it is also the the matter of some sort of a competition to be admitted to the university uh, then to be even admitted to a certain uh, um, master classes or professor's classes uh, then of course it is uh, it is some sort of a competition to uh, to to do a studio visit with a curator and then to be chosen to uh, certain exhibitions so uh, i think that it is very difficult to um, to discuss uh, the idea of the or to criticize the idea of a competition and to focus only on the awards and the prizes in the art world because it is something that is um, uh, basically prevalent in the like from the very beginning of the uh, of anyone's artistic career uh, they need to be involved in the competition and uh, and I think that uh, there is a need to uh, there is a need to discuss uh, this system starting from the artistic education, basically. Um, I I would have one more short question. Maybe you could uh, just uh, give a quick answer to that. Um, what do you think about uh, another approach to this prize system? For example, by the Berlin Art Prize. Uh, where namely the artworks are submitted anonymously, aiming at a higher degree of equity in the selection process. Do you see the uh, crucial difference to that old, that other system? Uh, sorry, what was again the, like how is it uh, run with the art price, Berlin art price? I, uh... um, the artworks are submitted anonymously so the artworks submitted are not related to a certain artist. Um, I don't know. I think that it's very difficult to judge uh, an artwork without the uh, context of other uh, works. Uh, so I would have a big difficulty if I was in a jury of such price. But it's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is uh, maybe not touching on the key problematic aspect of um, of this. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't think it's just a matter of being anonymous or of being a name. I don't even think it has to do with the star system. I think it has to do with this um, uh, structure of you know celebrating. Um, uh, celebrating a, a competition. I think in our case, it was very clear, maybe from the award ceremony, that uh, I think even the the film, um, I, th I think the film winner wasn't even announced, like um, in the midst of all that was happening. So it was very clear that the emphasis was not even on the art or the artist. Mm -hmm. So it was really to raise a question mark about what is the, you know, what what are these prizes meant to do? Because one way to think of them, and I think this is when we said we take it at face value, is to think, okay, they're meant to support artists, whether, you know, you feel like an artist, you want to, to support them financially or support them through exposure. And, you know, maybe there, that's not, an, um, not, not a bad thing. Um, but um, <clears throat> but uh, if, you know, if that's the case, then I think you need to structure it uh, differently. But I think what has happened, you know, in other cases, like with the Turner Prize, where the winners shared the, um, you know, shared the prize. I mean, these are also different forms that could be uh, maybe much more, um, you know, if you define what the goal of the prize is, then you can also structure it to, to serve better that goal. Um, I don't think we have really done the hard work of, of thinking through formats and of coming up with an alternative format, but we just wanted to identify that this was really a problematic aspect. If the uh, the goal of the prize was to support artists, then I, I think this is not the, the best way to, to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
just looking at the time, I think maybe we should move on to the third aspect of the letter so we have it all, all together and then uh, we can continue. Okay, so I'm starting. Uh, we believe that all exhibitions, including the exhibitions of the shortlisted nominees, should include an artist fee. Furthermore, artist talks, panels, and public discussions should also include fees. Artists contribute uh, greatly to the prestige of this prize, uh, and their labor, like all forms of labor, needs to be compensated proportionally. Uh, the fact that the Prize National Gallery does not have a monetary value, and that the exhibitions and public talks of its nominees do not include fees, means that artists are rewarded only with the promise of exposure. There is an unspoken assumption that the participants are likely to be remunerated by the market as a result of being nominated for or winning the prize. As artists, we know uh, this is not always the case. The logic of artists working for exposure feeds directly into the normalization of the unregulated pay structures ubiquitous in the art field, field as well as uh, into the expansion of the power of the commercial sector over all aspects of the field. Um, lastly, we welcome discussion on these issues from the museum, its friends and sponsors, and all relevant stakeholders, including past nominees, in, hope that, in the hope that together we can improve the situation for future iterations of the prize iterations of the price. We hope that this discussion might be useful as a model for considering other similar events in the field of art. Um, yeah, maybe the first question uh, would be if uh, a discussion like this has ever taken place or if this one we are having right now is the first one since you delivered that letter or have there be um, conversations with um, past nominees or people from the museum. Can you ask that part again? Sorry, you you asked if we talked with with the museum or. I I was only uh, asking if uh, there were talks, uh, if there was a discussion with uh, people from the museum or maybe past nominees. I mean, slightly with past nominees on a kind of individual basis, but as far as I recall, we didn't really have any um, any more organized discussions with past nominees or or really with the uh, with the institution. Did we? Yeah, we, we had a we I mean, had an email exchange uh, with the institution. Um, right. Eventually, that's true. And uh, it was. Uh, I think it was. Uh, like it never got to this level of having a meeting to right. solve uh, to solve the problems because um, yeah I, I mean there was a meeting after the publication of our statement mm -hmm. hmm. with the email exchange yeah yeah no but there was a physical meeting after ah, so yeah there was a physical yeah there was a physical meeting yeah yeah, yeah. I forgot. Yeah, but as we see, the prize is still kind of continuing in its same structural format. And I think, uh, like you mentioned, with regards to the promise of exposure, I and mean, this is something that comes up again and again in the field of art, that at some point, the bigger the institution, kind of the, the less they're actually willing to, um, let's say, even pay in a <laughs> form of money. Um, so yeah, so I actually think they did introduce an artist fee. Yeah, 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 yeah they ah. did. Yeah. yeah, so I actually like uh, it's uh, it should be mentioned that uh, they did introduce uh, an artist fee, and uh, in general, I think that the uh, the nominees from the last year that I spoke uh, with were happy with the conditions. Uh, so the institution. Uh, did make a uh, work to change uh, um, the previous conditions for the nominees, and mm -hmm. um, and 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 I just I just want to say something about uh, basically uh, being rewarded with uh, with an exhibition instead of uh, of the uh, like monetary prize 
which of course was also never our argument that, uh, that there is no monetary price. It was just mentioned in the, uh, in the statement just to make it clear that there was like no, uh, like a monetary <laughs> remuneration involved uh, in this case is that uh, like after realizing this exhibition, I, uh, I really appreciate it as a, uh, as a great uh, remuneration for, as it was a great prize basically to, to be allowed to, to make this exhibition. Uh, and of course, the budget of the exhibition is something that uh, is just taken from the yearly budget of the uh, of the institution. So this exhibition would happen anyway. Uh, this money would have to be spent anyway. Uh, but uh, I really, I really appreciate that I was given this opportunity to to show in this institution uh, and to realize this work. We have uh, several comments that I see that have been pouring in and we don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, but just to the first one, uh, I love the fact that you intervened in the capitalist logic of the award itself by a gesture of protest and solidarity. It is a proposal of counteracting new liberal award policies from within. So it looks like there is a space of to maneuver or of maneuver to intervene in structures from the very within of A, competition and B, diversity logics, right? Do you think we could learn from this for other struggles? Oh my gosh, now there's like <laughs> lots of comments. Um, it looks like a para, para award strategy challenging the system from uh, winning by strategies that don't fit. Uh, I don't know if I can within, read that. maybe. Yeah, perhaps within, yes. But it is a big difference if you use your name or not, is a question of the meaning. The, is it a question of the meaning, the content of art piece, because the artist brand by the name is supercharged with other meanings <clears throat> than the content of the art piece. Okay, there's this conversation happening. I'm kind of sure I can read all of it right now. Um, Maybe I just uh, clarify uh, in relationship to this question, because I think I'm the one who said that. I didn't mean that there is no difference between using an artist name or not. Of course, there is a huge difference. I was just saying that's not, that was not the problem we had with that aspect, like uh, whether it would be anonymous would not have ha solved the problem we had with uh, this particular aspect. But of course, I agree, there is a huge difference. And, and maybe also just to comment on, um, uh, to comment on the first kind of question slash um, co commentary is, I think, I, I, uh, I mean, as Iman also mentioned, it's kind of rare that a group of artists who are, don't necessarily know each other before, don't, haven't necessarily worked together, are able to kind of uh, come together and, and do something collectively. Um, and there is always space to do that in group shows. And I think this is something I've learned from in our experience is that it's, it's always possible to reach out to the other artists or other individuals or collectives involved in any experience um, and see if there's a possibility to do something together to um, better define the conditions of which the show is taking place. Um, not, not, only, not, not only, let's say, as a resistance to kind of capitalist structures, but also to take agency over how the work is shown, how it's mediated, how it circulates, all of these things that artists maybe are kind of taught to like, give up to the institution and that is if it's not their work. And I don't think that's true. I think the kind of um, the politics of, of showing and circulating the work is, is, is um, and um, yeah, the, lang the language and methods around that is, is, is sometimes just as important as the work itself. And that can always be done in conversations and should be done in conversations with others because you never work kind of in a vacuum or in a, in a bubble as an artist, you're always working with other conversation partners. Um, so that was really a very rewarding uh, experience. And, and I think uh, like several of us have also tried to take that into other experiences or have also tried to do it previously. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's important to remember that that possibility is always there.
I guess I think these are very good last words. That's a nice perspective for the future. And um, yeah, since we are running or uh, already out of time, and Karina and Annette are already, uh, they are already. I can see, and maybe it's uh, time to say goodbye and a big thank you for you joining us. Thank you yeah. for inviting us. Thank you thank very you. much. Bye. Thanks for having Bye. us. Bye. 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 This is wonderful, Annette, that you are here. Welcome. Thanks a lot that you uh, did accept our invitation to this uh, dialogue. We are both in Berlin and uh, we will talk about uh, for the next 20 minutes about uh, commoning institution. But uh, before uh, we get into the subject, let me briefly introduce uh, Annette Mechtel. Since the mid-1990s, uh, you have been working as a curator, teacher, as an activist uh, and researcher. So, uh, will you add something? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I go along. I would say you have uh, many different roles and positions in the art context. Uh, especially at the intersection of dependent uh, project work, of creative uh, working contexts and uh, institutional issues. Um, and I'm sure you have been thinking a lot about institutional processes and power structures in all your roles. Uh, so it's interesting because now for about four months you have a new position. For the first time I would say you are running an institution, um, quite an important institution here in Berlin, um, an association, ein Kunstverein, die neue Gesellschaft für Bildung. Yeah, since I know you for a longer time, I know that um, um, the theme we want to discuss, commoning institutions, um, which we can discuss. Uh, by two sides, also eine Vergesellschaftung der Institution, the commoning institution on the one hand, but on the other hand also um, the possibility of an institution to um, drive commoning further, also die Vergesellschaftung uh, voranzutreiben and I guess that both um, sides of the theme are very important for you. And uh, before we go uh, deeper into this topic, I would like to start um, a little bit earlier and uh, to take up the question that the symposium rises here, what system actually? So my first point concerns uh, the system question because uh, the institution NGBK was founded uh, in the late 60s. Uh, in form of a, of a split, of a separation from an existing institution. And I uh, would like um, to ask you if you would like to tell us briefly about the situation in Berlin uh, during this time, late 60s, and um, about the critique of the existing contents that have been the starting point for uh, the foundation of the NGBK. Uh, perhaps like uh, like a form of anti-institutionalism. Anti yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you also for the uh, invitation to this um, interesting question, uh, which I think uh, perfectly fits <laughs> the background I'm uh, uh, I'm talking now from, um, uh, because the uh, NGBK is. Um, maybe a very good example of, um, to work on these topics. Um, it was actually founded in 69 um, as a split from the uh, existing uh, German Association for Fine Arts. And it was a split uh, then in two new Kunstvereine. One is the NGBK and the other is the NBK. 
And NGBK means uh, Neue Gesellschaft für Bildende Kunst, meaning um, that it's not only enough to show different forms of exhibitions um, and contemporary art as the second um, um, uh, Kunstverein um, was kind of pointing to, but it was mostly that um, it after the student revolution, after national socialism, um, uh, it needed more than that. And it needed a kind of new structure for um, decision makings even about what exhibition is supposed to be shown. So um, they um, understood the uh, NGBK as a, um, uh, a new um, structure um, of a Kunstverein in that sense that it was um, uh, a gra they, they started as a grassroot uh, structure, meaning, and actually they started and it still is, that is the ama amazing thing, um, um, meaning that um, grassroot, that it's the uh, members of the, um, of the Kunstverein who make the decisions about the program. So um, when you said that I'm um, running now the institution, I have no word to say about the program. I'm really <laughs> in the back. I'm only doing the job nobody else wants to do about you know, clearing up uh, custom questions and, uh, and writing the uh, funding applications. But the program is, actually, is really made by the, uh, is decided by the members. We have 980 members at the moment. <laughs> Annette, I, yes. I would like to interrupt you because this is such a large um, issue. I would go to show that this is a mo um, an institutional model which also which existed uh, in the history in the 19th century, and I would like to <laughs> to um, just to, to do a little trip before we come to that point again. Uh, because I'm, I think it's a, um, a Kunstverein is a typically German, um, German institutional model and probably um, not everybody knows it, but the majority of the Kunstvereine today, um, existing today, have been founded in the early 19th century. And uh, we can say beside uh, public theaters or, or liter literary salons, um, literarische salons, uh, Kunstvereine have been the platforms or the meeting points for um, for the intellectual and cultural avant-garde. So the point was at that time that the rising um, rising middle class wanted to open up spaces uh, for the public because art at that time could only be shown in spaces of uh, aristocracy which was not public, but they, they have been very close. So the starting point of the idea of Kunstverein is to broaden up or to open up an open space for, uh, for art. So I would say the first, uh, the, the, the commoning um, <laughs> element is, um, is deeply linked to this institution Kunstverein. Um, because they wanted to make art less exclusive, but to make it more public. And this is uh, on the second, the second point is that um, the commoning is deeply connected to the structure. And now we are coming back to, to your point, point because the structure is um, uh, the role of, of the membership. So the base of the Kunstverein are the members, everybody, all normal individuals can uh, apply for membership and uh, can in a certain way influence, um, yes, influence the institution. So that would be my question to you. <laughs> How does it function in NGBK? Because it's not a normal Kunstverein. Um, it's a Kunstverein who uh, takes the idea of membership much uh, broader and much um, yeah, wichtiger also, uh, uh, as in other... Heart. It's the heart of the NGPK, I would say. The heart. That, uh, um, that it's the members who 
rule the um, or who make the important decisions, uh, not only on the program but also on, for example, um, we just had a, a general assembly in June about um, the question of our location. And it was clear this is not something the chair or the board can decide or me as a, a managing director, but um, we have to go all the way back to our 980 members to make that decision. And um, so I think that's really the, uh, the core of the, the whole idea of the split also, that it's um, that to give the members uh, more power in a way or to, to um, um, by kind of giving them the decision making position to make them definitely not only into visitors or something like that. They're really, they are the Kunstverein. Mm -hmm. But um, can you, yeah, can you explain more um, your working process? Because okay. uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure not everybody knows how, how it works. Yeah, um, I have a picture here. Mm. Maybe I can show this. Um, it looks kind of complicated. <laughs> and well, the point is that, um, so the General Assembly makes decision on the program and these kind of important issues. And then um, um, the program um, is decided, I mean, for example, we had just in May uh, this kind of decision. Um, members can apply with projects and um, then the general assembly decides which projects will be kind of realized and out of these um, project groups um, uh, a kind of coordination board is set up and um, so every year new members in this kind of coordination board um, are voted in um, and in this coordination board we have also the uh, three um, chair members, um, which are in, in fact the ones who are taking all the risk. They are the ones in other Kunstvereine who are uh, running the board and making this, the main decisions. But here they are just, they have just the same votes as the people, uh, as the project members who had been selected through this general assembly. So I think that's also kind of a very uh, special situation that um, that uh, the chair has not has no uh, has no uh, has not more power than um, any other member who has been voted into this coordination board, and um, so um, this coordination board is kind of preparing decisions which have to be then brought back to the General Assembly. So they make decisions on, or they make um, rather, they, um, they give, uh, they prepare certain procedures or they give, um, yeah, they prepare um, project uh, applications and so on, so that um, the decisions can be um, made um, on this level of the general assembly, so they are, they are something like the the running. Um, they they keep the um, this kind of system running in the daily business, and um, but the final decisions, as I said, are uh, made uh, have to always be be, um, be brought back to the general assembly, which was now in these times of uh, Corona a real challenge to to um, organize um, a general assembly online with um, this amount of members, actually not so many then were taking part, but could have been taking part. And um, so um, maybe I'll bring it back. Um, so there's a constant change here happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, that's an important issue that um, um, through this um, general assembly, um, all the time, um, um, the, the the structure of the decision making is kind of um, processed, uh, and that's important to bring in 
um, new topics, bring in new themes, bring in new formats, and um, constantly also, um, um, yeah, I would say, um, you know, on institute a certain um, uh, goals also of the uh, or main issues of the of the NGBK. Um, I think the symposium, symposium is well designed because we ha have the place uh, directly after the uh, discussion about the price of the National Gallery and we heard that an institution as big as the National Gallery uh, cannot reinvent uh, itself um, um, constantly. But would you say APK is a role model of an institution where this reinventation or reinstitutionalization is, um, um, is the aim? So is the process of discuss, this discussion the aim? Um, and is it the point that you would say this institution is open enough to um, um, and fluid enough, not, um, um, I'm sorry for my English, um nicht alles zu, um Bewegung weiterhin zu ermöglichen, to, uh, to, to give the basis for, um, for movement. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, I mean, it's amazing that this model from 69 is, is such a model for the future because it gives, I think, for, especially for the Kunstverein, it makes it very um, low, it has a very low threshold for certain topics to be brought up. And, um, and I think... Um, Perhaps you can give an example. Um, what yeah, for example, it was interesting, the last uh, General Assembly making, making this decision about the next year's program, um, decided to show an exhibition with um, Kurdish um, artists in diaspora. And I think that's, and um, as we now found out, it's really more or less the first time this is going to happen uh, here in Berlin and in Germany. And uh, so that's a really, uh, um, I think, uh, um, we were really glad and we found it, we were really proud that, that they asked uh, they came to the NGBK to kind of um, develop this uh, exhibition further. Or we have, on the other hand, uh, we have an exhibition coming up uh, with a female artist group from the GDR, um, um, who is of course not existing anymore, but this material hasn't been shown. And so it's kind of filling a gap in the, you know, in the art field. Mm -hmm. So I think this is kind of um, fluent, power structure, we, it, it makes it easier for certain topics to get in, you know, and of course, but as you, I mean, it does, uh, of course, we are clear that um, power is constantly being established, you know, and um, of course, this is uh, uh, the big challenge, uh, even in our structure, to constantly question uh, solidity solidification of power structures. Mm -hmm. And I think it's even happening in our case. Okay, yeah, this is, uh, I think, a very interesting point. So if I summarize, can we say, um, if we want a, a, a more um, inclusive society or more hetero, heterogeneous uh, society, we need more spaces or more institution um, in that way, they question, uh, their own structure um, and re-negotiate re, re again and again the topics uh, like you, you explained it? Yeah, I think the, the main point about this grassroots is that we are constantly um, discussing, uh, I mean, we are questioning our structures or we have to question them also constantly. And um, because we, if the goal is to have this, um, you know, to um, to work on this illusion of um, of certain topics, then this is like something you have to be constantly be aware of that you are building up new structures mm -hmm. and illusions. So, um, uh, but um, to have the space and uh, this kind of structure for this negotiation, I think that's the point. So, in our structure, there is a lot of uh, space and time. 
uh, for this negotiation. Some people said, are you crazy to work there? And they are all the talk, they are, there's so much discussion. But I think, yes, of course, that's the point. I mean, um, uh, if you don't if, if you don't negotiate these topics uh, constantly, I mean, we are, you know, we are stuck in certain structures and we build up certain solidifications. Yes, I think you are the right person for this job. <laughs> but this would be also a, a true question. Uh, what what challenge is this for you personally? Um, it's it's also a question of, of power, um, of personal power uh, to manage uh, and stand this dynamic and to, uh, to drive it further all the time and to, uh, at some point, you have to come to decisions. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um, um, it was interesting with this question of this, the location because we had an offer and I was sitting in a, a meeting and then they said, yeah, well, you're the managing director. Can you make now a decision? I said, no, I can't. I need at least three months to make that decision. So, I mean, you have to work in a different time frame for making decisions. That's a real challenge. That's a challenge, yeah. So, a question now to the organizers. Uh, the time is over. Should we open now the discussion for the public or what is your plan? First of all, thank you so much for being here and for this insightful talk and for these insights in a already existing, since decades, existing structure of what we will call in our next panel, peer forming the commons. Um, actually, I... It, um, we thought about um, the possibility of people to come up with questions, but nobody came up with questions, neither in the etherpad nor in the chat. So I can... Ah! Fantastic! There is one question and I propose we take this one in and then we come to an end so that um, we can prepare for the next talk. But this is a beautiful one by Martin Fritz. I will read it. At Württembergischer Kunstverein in Stuttgart, he's on the board, we, theori we theorize about the following scenario. What if the new scenes and new people with new ideas that you mentioned among voting members or prospective members would show right-wing affiliations and sympathies? Do you have regulations that would allow to expel, let's say, AfD-leaning members at NGBK? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question, and we were just um, bring. I mean, this is going to be a topic on the next um, um, meet, co uh, coordination meeting. Um, uh, how can an anti-racist practice um, look like in the Kunstverein, and what are regulations we need also for that? So that I think is something um, uh, uh, we are. Um, uh, we have, I can't give you an answer yet, but it's clear that this is like um, uh, exactly uh, um, a situation uh, where this negotiation has to be um, um, maybe, um, you know, has to, the, the negotiation has, to, it has to have a space for this negotiation and um, um, I think that's maybe, um, I mean, I can say how we, how we are go going to solve this problem now. Um, that because, um, of course, uh, as you all know, that AfD is very interested in getting into cultural politics. And, uh, and so um, we are going to talk how we, um, where we have to make certain, um, how, how our kind of, um, open-minded goal and our um, our uh, aims in kind of an anti-racist uh, practice go together. There are, of course, uh, limits to each other. And um, yeah, so, so I think um, uh, um, there will be, of course, limits to, to um, how far this kind of openness goes. Another question? One more, one yeah. more by Nina. Are the members really taking or using their responsibility in decision making and how it happens in practical way 
or it is or is it waving a lot yeah that's a very good question um, um of course um the members are sometimes not aware of what responsibility they have uh, but this is kind of important decision we just had to make about our location it uh, was uh, really a nice move that uh, that a lot of members became clear how that they have a vote in that decision and that they really also were um, informing themselves and finding out about the arguments and so on um, but this is i think uh, something um, what is also really important in that concept um, that uh, members know about uh, the general um, project and not only that they are not only interested in in their own um, art project but in the project of the of the institution in itself so thank you Annette yes thank you and um, thanks for the interesting questions also <laughs> bye 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 Welcome, welcome to Peer Forming the, com the Commons, the last discussion for today, a talk Thank on you. digital commoning practices and P2P technology with Station of Commons. I am very happy and honored to speak with our hosts, um, Gregoire Rousseau and Juan Gomez, and with Yin I went from Reunion. Let me just quickly present the speakers and then I guess you will have so much to say that um, I don't want to take so much of our time. But Yin Ai Wen is a practicing designer, researcher, theorist, strategist and project developer who uses <coughs> writing, speculative design and time-based art to examine the social impact of planetary communication technologies. She advocates relationship for uh, between technology and society. Besides publishing and exhibition, exhibiting internationally, she also works as a strategist and researcher for cultural institutions. You obtained an MFA degree from Design Department of Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam and a BFA on Visual Communication from Beijing Institute of Fashion Technology. And you are a practice tutor at the Master Institute of Visual Cultures and a researcher at Karat, Center of Applied Research for Art Design and Technology at Evans University of Applied Sciences. And in 2019, you got a prize, we talked about prizes today, the informed prize for conceptual design for your work. So um, for me, it's the first time, it's a pleasure to meet you. And um, thank you so very much for accepting the invitation that came from Station of Commons and for discussing with us. Then we have two speakers from Station of Commons, Juan Gomez, who is a media artist and interaction designer who lives and works in Geneva, Switzerland. He graduated from the Haute Ecole d'Art et de Design in Geneva and is currently a PhD candidate on peer-to-peer -peer dynamics in the context of decentralized technologies. So we will speak about that topic from a perspective of research as well. He's working in the intersection between art and design, organizes workshops on critical technology, creates panels on contemporary publishing practices, and conceives interactive installations with programming tools he develops. And we can, we can be very grateful because one of them is actually the context in which this whole conference takes place. So Juan, number one, thank you for making this happen. Number two, thank you for thinking with us. And our third guest, tonight and host at the same time, guest and host at the same time, is Grégoire Rousseau, an artist and educator based between Helsinki and Paris. He's actually an electrical engineer. He has qualifications in electrical engineering. So Grégoire Rousseau is an electrical engineer and he's a master of fine arts. So artist and engineer, his artistic work questions the role of the machine, the algorithm within the digitally controlled society, the complexity of neoliberal interests in relation to public knowledge and to commons within technological space. Beside his artistic practice for the last 10 years, Rousseau has taught in the Finnish Academy of Fine Arts, where he developed and realized the first space dedicated to technology 
that opened in 2013 already. He regularly lectures on art within technological space, including at Aalto University, the, the ONSBA in Paris, the French Institute in Finland, and CAC in Shanghai. In 2001, he founded the electronic music record label Tula Nauhat, and in 2014, he co-founded Rap Rap, the journal for political and formal inquiries in arts with Seskin Boynik. Yeah, and then in 2018, he wrote a small publication, a little book called Learning from Electric Energy in the Arts, Knowledge happens together and is now part of the Station of Commons Collective. Here we are together. It is a huge honor for me to speak with you and to understand more. Um, so peer forming the Commons, the stage is yours. Yes. So the, thank you, Nora, for the extremely precise uh, introduction. <coughs> thank you for inviting. It's been a pleasure working with you. And uh, even before maybe going into detail on how, how we, we think digital commoning practices uh, together with one and the uh, reunion network, I would like to say that we really appreciate and that we understand that uh, offering uh, alternative to Zoom, uh, like making an event that is not uh, only Zoom based, must not have been an uh, easy uh, decision for you. Uh, I mean, it involved taking a uh, risk. This is what I think, because like having a Zoom, only Zoom uh, symposium is something easy. And something easy is that maybe what everybody wants, but it seems that you were not searching for the easy way. And you decided to support an alternative open source way of distribution information. And we are very uh, grateful, even more than uh, grateful. I think it's a, it's a very good uh, example of uh, commoning uh, practices and digital commoning practices. Because if we think of this uh, event in the uh, wide uh, perspective, it really required a very wide vari variety of practices and knowledge. As you were saying, uh, I work together with uh, Juan, but we, we work at, uh, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but at different layers of technology. And we even had to work with Olaf that we thank uh, very much for this uh, symposium to happen. And this is what I think is uh, com commoning, uh, digital commoning practices in the context contested uh, space that is technology nowadays. It must bring people together to achieve something. And this symposium is a great example of that. So uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing that once more, because we really, really, uh, at, yeah, I, we really realized the, the the decision and the collective decision that is uh, behind that, and we consider it already a, a political decision to do to do it that way, as uh, to think together an alternative of what is supposed to be the only way to communicate. Uh, it's a great move, and we are extremely uh, grateful to participate there. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you so much for the really enthusiastic introduction. And uh, I look through the program today. It was all like all the topics that I have been concerning all the time. I just like wish I can like be the whole the whole program. And uh, I look forward to just like, re like to look back for all the recording and uh, take more inspiration for uh, sort of like like minded practice. It's a very good program and important discussion that we should all have in this very pe uh, peculiar time that we are all in but also like great opportunity for us to like forcing us to think of different ways of organizing different value different way to think about each other so um yeah i hope that we will offer like sort of like a nice end note of the day uh for uh, a lot more food for thought yeah Exactly. Yeah. Yes. The, Juan, you want to say something? You're muted. Oh, no. Juan is always muted. Juan. Yes, because I, I, I like to be uh, in, the, in the back. No. In the back office where everything happens, usually. But uh, I wanted to thank you. Uh, and I also wanted to say, uh, just maybe not a, maybe a precision, is that I just uh, got uh, accepted to be a PhD candidate. So while we're talking uh, for P2P, let's say that this is the first event that will kind of fit that question that we'll have for the next years. So this is kind of the first uh, 
kickstarting event for uh, my research. So maybe I will not go, uh, as you say, in a research perspective for now, but I will uh, peer, by the peer knowledge of everyone, we will uh, fit on that. <laughs> So what is the research question actually that we start here? It's how to how could we rethink commoning practices through peer-to-peer -peer technologies? Uh, or how would you I, formulate I, the research I, I, from from the from our our uh, perspective? I think that co com, uh, beginning to think peer-to-peer -peer technology as the continuity of our previous effort, the, there is a genealogy happening there. It's not something that comes from the sky and they oh, let's be interested in P2P. The, the reason why we are especially interested now in this uh, research topic, it's, it starts uh, from the audio broadcast. Because we, when, of course, we wanted to have audio broadcast, but to do it properly, it required to really understand the path of information. Like how the information from the artist goes to the server, then goes to the audience. There are different steps, both in terms of infrastructure and in terms of uh, protocols. It means that if you want to send data from one place to another place, there is not obviously one way. There are actually many ways to make it to happen. One of the normal way is uh, internet from your uh, internal, uh, internet service provider. You can use a VPN, which is more uh, secure, but then you can use this other way, which is peer-to-peer. Uh, which is this uh, way of doing, way of thinking that uh, avoid this uh, central uh, server. The communication ha happens between the two peers. And uh, thinking the communication that, that way changes uh, many things, actually. And that's why we wanted to invite uh, the Reunion Net Network on this topic because the we are somehow working, uh, juggling with the, same, with the same ideas, but from different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. I, will, uh, yeah. I will just add something to that is that um, I think the right, uh, as you said, there's a logic uh, that's uh, like for why we end up here or we are still here. And then I think that the, that you said like true technologies is more specifically decentralized technology. So uh, with all these crises and with the, all, all the urgency uh, when we, uh, when all, everything started and people started searching for architectures for them to communicate, there was a, um, now I think this is the moment where we're seeing that many of the architectures that were put in place, such as Zoom or many of the collaborat so collaborative software, uh, we see that these are these are were not centralized, although they were like um, say sold as centralized. So I think this is the real question is like to see how there was like an open source washing or like kind of a washing of uh, in the language of how people get into these architectures, and I think this is how what is for me. Uh, important at least in this p2p question is uh, to define decentralized and in the mm -hmm. context of this um, in this symposium i think it, it has come in many ways when we're talking about prices when we're talking about uh, museums decentralized has always been around like uh, yeah uh, flying all over the the symposium i think this is also how there's a link uh, between uh, peer to peer um, dynamics so what are the what are the experience and perspectives of reunion um, yeah, uh, maybe uh, I think that reunion offer a perspective that we really we doesn't really start from technology uh, itself per, uh, per se, but rather is an inquiry about like imagining what 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 do we mean by decentralized society uh, for, to to begin with? Because like so many uh, blockchain project or the latest, and then even the earlier internet projects. They always start with this idea is almost very um, Malohanian kind of belief that once you put out a decentralized technology, the society is going to be decentralized because that's what the message supposed to send out. But we see that uh, that when the technology roll out, it actually uh, being rendered in so many different ways, and it always, uh, almost always roll back to even the worst stage that we previously imagined. 
And I feel like uh, since 2017, I sort of like had this question, like it seems to be a lack of imagination about what does decentralized society actually mean? And then what do we actually want from that, right? So it feels like we, we maybe are always doing it in, uh, we should probably do it in the, the other way around is that we need to imagine what is a good society for us? What is like, if we talk about P2P technology and what is a design P2P technology. For me, it will be uh, as some, someone that is uh, more on the design uh, side of things that thinking more from the perspective of experience, I would be really curious to, to, to know what, what does it mean when P2P uh, experience means like, does it mean that I, like, for instance, in this whole meeting, we are talking to each other. We know, we are, as the process goes, we are getting to know each other, whether it's uh, professionally or interpersonally, uh, doesn't matter. But like this kind of whole process sort of like give me agency of like knowing what this relationship is heading to or where it is about. And however, in, I, I feel like in many kind of technology is so that they always like work still on the idea of mass communication, the mass uh, customization. Uh, we always like so that like imagining the, the relationship can be somehow deconstructed into components and then like it's like it can be put into assembly line. And that is basically always the, the premises of all the technologies being designed. Like we, we dream about modularizing everything. And, and so like with reunion, the premises will be trying to do it the other way around is that imagine we actually have an ideal society in place. How does that technology actually would look like? You know, um, so in that sense, like if we work backward, we actually have a lot of interesting deduction about how that technology should be designed and, and uh, in a lot of way. So we even started with this kind of premises and also uh, wanted to put focus on care because care is like actually breaking down into so many assumptions about how technology is supposed to work because care is relational. It needs to be contextualized. It's emotional. It's so much identity based uh, who is giving me uh, to uh, uh, giving me care and uh, how our the health of our relationship goes is so important and then but the current way of designing technology doesn't really think uh, support that much uh, it's rather like we uh, most of the proposal is about like how care can be fit into the technological framework instead of the other way around so a reunion sort of like sort of like trying to pencil in, in from that perspective and that is somehow I think working in like the, the, the other side of the ping pong with the station of commons is like station of common really thinking from the technological perspective thinking about ethics but then we are working on the other way around but that makes the whole ping pong is very interesting along the line yeah so yeah, it sounds very convincing. So I, what I understand is that actually what you say is that the technology that moves us, like for example, Zoom is based on a logistic, is based on a logistical economic idea of roles um, yeah. that, that actually is super not careful. That is all but careful. So yeah. how would I have to imagine, but just because maybe I, my imagination is not good enough. So how would I imagine um, technology that starts from care of another possible world? Um, so maybe I should go in to talk about how reunion works, if that sort of like gives some sort of material for us to later expand on that discussion. Um, so let me uh, share my screen. Is yes. David, okay. Are you, are you seeing it? Yes. yes. My screens. Okay. So yes, so uh, our sort of motto slogan called commenting by P2P care. So it's almost like station of uh, common except for the care part. <laughs> and, and like, just like very Here specific angle. Um, Sharing is caring. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so I basically just have a quick walkthrough of how the system uh, goes. Like we actually develop a kind of like app 
for like we see like sort of like system as a way to address certain kind of ideology so again like if our ideology is um it is about care. How do we understand care? Care as a, a, a the vehicle of understanding relationship. So uh, from that perspective, we're trying to rendering into the UX, UI design, etc. So I'm just going to show you if you are a new user coming into Reunion Network, what will you be doing? Um, so first, so uh, when you uh, get into the Reunion app. The first thing that you would get an answer is uh, how do you like to call yourself? Like from there, we already set up some kind of like um, some sort of like very psychoanalysis thing is that to sort of subtly remind you that you are not necessarily the social identity that is being imposed on you, but you are a separate identity entity that is like it's a different. I, I, a different idea other than like how other people call you. So um, from there, we sort of like set up that kind of little distance about the social identity versus uh, our sort of individual psych. And so let's say someone call themselves and then we welcome them. And then, uh, and that immediately go into the next question is, uh, let's create the first relationship the first and default and undissolvable relationship that is with yourself. So there is already like from the beginning question about how do you call yourself is that you're starting to uh, understand their multiple, uh, multiple, multiple self uh, that is encoding within your one body, right? So, uh, so like you have a relationship with that individual self, uh, psych, uh, other than like, you know, uh, an avatar, an account name that just merely represent uh, who you are as a brand. And here, uh, it, like we were starting to ask you, how do you feel about this relationship? However, this feeling is not described by emoji, it's not uh, graded by uh, five stars or one to 10, but rather we ask you to grade it, to, to mark it with a color. Now, this kind of color is also uh, also, again, I work with the uh, clinical uh, 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 psychiatrist uh, uh, clinical practice that is one uh, when a person is being too distant from their feeling, uh, usually a psychiatrist will ask them to sort of like draw something, make a color book to so that instead of writing about how you feel, you draw about how you feel. And that is actually providing, giving a more intrinsic and in, intuitive connection with your actual feeling. And, but it also provides a very interesting entry point to think about a uh, different way to design data in a digital system. Because in this way, like even though everyone in this whole meeting marking yellow for how they feel about themselves, it may mean very, very different thing. And even when, as we sort of like, as a human being, we progress over time, uh, the yellow that I feel in when I was 10, comparing to what I feel about yellow now is also very different. So there's always this kind of like progression of, uh, uh, of a frame of uh, like, sort of like uh, there's no common keys in all, this, all the data. When a system is all collecting yellow for the 5 million user that all marking as yellow, they means very different thing and then they can recognize it by themselves, but the system cannot recognize what it actually means. So we think that that is actually a way that not only bring more uh, agency for people how to feel and express how they feel in the system, but also it takes uh, like actual control in terms of privacy. So uh, that's a little sort of <laughs> like, little saga in the, in the system design. And so like after you create your first activity that you have done, you, you, after you sort of like have the feeling mark by color, and then it will also ask you how to like create sort of like first activity that you have done yourself, uh, done for yourself. And here is, uh, yeah, so after you sort of mark how you feel, then the system will ask you to do, to 
so that like create your first activity for yourself. And these like activities uh, here, activity like even feeding yourself, taking care of yourself, giving time for yourself to think and meditate is all count as the activity for yourself. And then the, the, the reason that you, you, you should do that and mark that is because like not only for yourself to sort of like as a diary, but at the same time, it actually count into the idea of time in, in here that you would like, because the system will also uh, constantly trying to watch out all the relationship that you enter and all the activity that you have to do. And then we want and to make how, sure. How, how does relationship happens actually? Because this may be interesting. Basically, yes. you sort of, uh, you, 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 you enter, you enter relationship first by your own meditation about uh, mm -hmm. what is happening within your own relationship. But then like later on, you can send invitation for the other people mm -hmm. to accept that uh, like being paired. And you like through that, you like that relationship being known by each other. And then from that, you can sort of like generate the kind of currency. Uh, this is like sort of the whole economy map where you, you sort of like generate your sort of like personal, like you have your own personal currency that combine with the other person which you can spend together. And so like from the currency technological point of view, we take blockchain as the, the kind of opportunity to do program, programmable money that we actually program the relationship uh, into the, the, the currency. So that that work as an incentive for people to actually keep on maintaining that relationship. And when you create a contract for each other, it's sort of like it's always set as a long term thing. So a different from like a short term exchange that is temporal and then it is, also it is, uh, so, Sorry to interrupt. This, this point of the temporary different temporality happening in commoning practices is something that is very important and that we we we, yeah. we talked about it when we prepared the, this uh, symposium uh, maybe yes. one week ago this this was very very interesting in terms of uh, in terms of something that i watched in previous video of yours where we were, tra where, where, sorry, where you define like different uh, care you know, to, to care for something, to care uh, with something. This was something that I really uh, appreciate in your talk. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think also like the, the long-term versus uh, different from temp temporal uh, connection or, or even the more common institutional practice as like the, the permanent relationship, like marriage and family relationship, the long term provide a kind of stationary feeling for people to know how to develop a caring relationship, but it's also, uh, and then, which is very important for uh, giving the agency for people to feel that they actually have a stake in the relationship. But what, what, what I think is the, what, what in the way station of commons relates to temporality is that temporality defined as well the type of relationship because like co commercial relation, it, it happened to be a relation is uh, short and it's having a contract. And then th there are some other type of relation that uh, requires uh, or involves and commit different type of uh, means of working. So mm. in, in this sense, I see a continuity between tempor uh, relation, temporality, mm -hmm. and a means of production, which is something that Station of Commons really uh, wants to focus, which mm. is like the, what, what we are after. So in that yeah. sense, we, we would like to relate relation to temporality, to means of production. This was an interesting point. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think that also, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> because the reappropriation re of technology <coughs> is some, um, yeah, like to me, it's really like the, uh, the main articulation. This is something that, uh, re requires different practices, different knowledges, like the thing thinking together happen. It's just like another re reappropriation of technology, just yeah, another that, word to say. I think that the, the, the current, uh, like the contemporary condition, uh, relationship that we have to technology or to our tools is gotten very complex. Complex to the point that, of course, there are uh, companies, there's, there's people that want you to understand better how stuff, how something works so that you can embrace it. This is a work by itself. I think appropriating technology comes with a, it's a process 
and it's a process that, as you said, requires different knowledges. Um, like uh, Ivan Ilich will say this about in tools of for conviviality or how to develop community-based tools that will uh, like will arouse and in the long term they will like have some meaning even though they will change because the same way that uh, the silex which has changed our hands it, they, it will also shape the community that we are right so it will it will is a like a loop will be uh, fulfilled um, yeah. I think it's very, very important point what you say when you refer to uh, Silex is that technology has not always been a mobile phone servers and computers. I mean, like the first industrial revolution was steam. And then the way steam was used as a new way to provide energy is something else. And then the second revolution was electricity. And when I was in the first place uh, referring to this symposium as a form of resistance, I think it's uh, the, the case, whatever the technology being, silex, steam, or electricity. I mean, uh, in different culture, different way, different sayings, but uh, in a factory during a strike time, if you want to bring the uh, owner of the factory to the negotiation table, you, 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 you cut the electricity, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, everybody's willing to talk. So, <laughs> so. So if we, if we want to, to reappropriate technology, we have to understand the consequences of it and what we are after. So Maybe in that a, sense. Yeah, sorry. Yes, no, 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 no problem. I just wanted to uh, have some, maybe some, um, because I liked something I, I really like about reunion is the, let's say non, um, so I'm, I'm very interested in my research about uh, like architecture that are built without buildings. And I think uh, what I'm seeing now in this presentation and like the, the, the speech that's behind it uh, reminds me a lot of Aldo Van Eyck and all these architects from the 60s that were building a playground so for kids. And uh, there, there was an, a political standpoint, a standpoint when they, they were doing this. And I think this kind of, the, I like this a lot about reunion is that there is some kind of architecture that is constructed, but it's not physical. It's not, you cannot, uh, it's going to be constructed in the relationships. And I, I find it to be very interesting in a, yeah, let's say in a, in a, in a, a spatial design perspective, because at the end of it all, I think that that's, a, um, yeah, that's a big question that we had at the beginning of the Station of Common was, and I think we all started with the idea of, of spatial. And spatial at the end, we have not defined it as, I think we're still like defining it. What does it mean, a spatial, um, a spatial the, like concept to conceptualize a space? But this is an approach I like a lot in the sense that it involves uh, um, technological means, but there's also some speculation to it. I think that the, the, the mix of the two have a, a very interesting um, uh, way of interacting and showing. Maybe I'm a bit naive, so it, it might be that my questions are stupid, but I cannot help myself, I have to ask them. So my first question, and then there's also one by Leopold for Future that I will also really mention, but for, my first question to you is, um, if I think about feelings and relation, especially from a perspective of psychoanalysis that you mentioned, um, honestly, I mean, they are complicated, mixed, ambivalent, and full of violence and conflict. So the, what I don't see in this imagination of relation in the debate that we have is the very complicatedness of actual relation in society. And there is also important that they are full of conflict because if what we have heard before from NGBK, uh, classically power tends to keep itself Definitely. and does not want to be questioned. So how can, how can all this needed conflictuality be inscribed in the idea of the relation? Yeah, I think that is basically the whole mission of the reunion is that we're trying to disseminate all this kind of thing into the whole uh, system design. Like if you think about any kind of digital system, it itself is an institution. Like think about how Facebook is an institution that sort of like put you in a position that you're always in real name and then you are not allowed to explore any uh, like any version of of yourself other than a presentable one that is actually a very passive aggressive kind of way to think about uh, a, a a society with all kind of connection right so what reunion does is actually it's not one for all and all for one that kind of idea 
but rather you have like so many different stages where you have your own self, uh, like the relationship with yourself, but the relationship with all the people that you fantasize, but you don't have to make it to everyone. No, you can just like be your own sort of little play playground until the moment that you sort of connect with someone else, then like you know that the other person know that you think about it that way. And at the same time, the data doesn't really also, con uh, doesn't contribute to a some sort of, you know, passive aggressiveness as like, I rate you four star, there's some, something missing about you, that kind of thing. So like, so that we keep the ambiguity as a way to allow people to navigate conflict, negative feelings or, and positive feelings that like, so like you sort of uh, thinking about how a system to do less or don't do certain things to leave the agency to the user. And of course, like the different stage of transparency as Joanne was talking about different kind of architecture is sort of like translated into sort of different stage of contract that you have the contract with yourself that is completely private, but you have the sort of P2P contract with other people or have money involved or not. And then you'll have the third stage that is say, actually involving recognition from the state, uh, but you can always choose to not to do the. And then there's also a checkpoint where uh, every time that you, you sort of like checking in with each other, whether the contract we signed uh, last year, actually is this still making sense for us? So like that as a system itself is sent out the message that telling you a relationship is constantly changing. That like it, of course it's a very fine thing is like telling you that your relationship is temporal versus your relationship is always changing. How do you actually design a system that is actually telling people the uh, the, the 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 circle of life while not being a violent advocate? You know, so it's very delicate. Like we have to test it with so many people, but it also again. It asked the, the designer of the technology how how much it's more about like how much you understand the nature of relationship instead of how much you understand the technology almost yeah yeah I, I would like to okay uh, so now okay I, 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 thought, I saw the question of Leopold I don't know if uh, if I can say mm -hmm. something about it now or should we wait at, at the end yes I just wanted to put okay. it up I wanted to say there is the question of Leopold for future should this be an alternative to what Tim Berner Lee is up to think a question to all of you. Yeah, I, I, th that's what I wanted to say because what you just said is interesting from methodology because um, uh, Jean is uh, talking about uh, in a design perspective or in a, a design a system. And uh, this is like the opposite of what Station of Commons is uh, operating. Uh, am I here still? Yeah. Because uh, usually in design, you start with a big uh, proposition and then you narrow it into some testing phases, testing phases until you, uh, yeah, until you define it, let's say. I think, um, like, just to answer this Tim Berners-Lee kind of perspective, I think he went also in the same question. He was also trying to make a figure on how this ca this relationship would work, but then because of uh, a mostly capital capital reasons of how this will actually expand and scale, he could not make it possible. So there were some decisions that he took that he knew were not uh, correct in the sense that we will follow his proposal, but were correct in the sense that it will scale up in that way. So Tim Berners-Lee, just as a comment, he's an ongoing, in an ongoing new project, uh, which uh, is also like trying to decentralize and to use peer-to-peer -peer dynamics and decentralized technologies to rethink the internet again. I think he did a conference in 2018 or 17 around this subject. Uh, so yeah, to follow up, I think what's important to know is that the hype of these technologies or the hype of this, uh, or, or, or when it came out, like Bitcoin and all this, the, the hype is already gone. So I think it is a good moment to see what people have done when they were very much into like doing a lot of cryptocurrency stuff, we're doing a lot of stuff of, 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 of things using decentralized technologies. I think this is a good moment for, because things have lowered down. So yeah, just have an open eye, open eye on uh, Tim Berners-Lee to see if, uh, if he's proposing something new. <laughs> Okay, so let's immediately take up Angela's question because it comes back to many moments also of our symposium because we ask what system actually and we are within a very strong system that moves us and moves our relationships so what angela asks practical question how to create a digital commons when much of the infrastructure involved in digital communications is privatized or controlled by governments 
What do you think? I may, I, I may answer a bit that because it's, it's actually an interesting question because it relates at the same time the infrastructure and then what is happening within the infrastructure. Meaning that the, the infrastructure is something uh, material in terms of communication. It's like the wires and like how, do, how does it reach your home, which Wi-Fi you're going to use and so on. However, the, the protocol in use uh, for communication, they, they, they do not belong to anyone. That's why they can operate open source. That's why VPN can, I mean, virtual private network can happen. That's how the P2P network can exist. Uh, let's take, for instance, uh, that, which is that protocol, which maybe at the time is the most known peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol. They are open source. So indeed, as the question refers, the point is the infrastructure, because how to avoid that? Yes, it's a big question. Plus, plus that the infrastructure is multi-layered multi-layered because even beyond the materiality of the cables and the wi-fi and so on th there is how do you reach the internet how do you actually connect to your other peers i mean for instance in in germany we know that all the internet traffic is filtered monitored and controlled i mean there some years ago there was uh, I, I had at least a lot of friends who, who got a huge fine because of uh, download uh, uh, torrent download so this is something that we have to be aware and that we know and still there are ways to uh, avoid those uh, uh, controlled and privatized infrastructures i will also course, like to say that uh, sorry yeah, go on it's okay that architecture uh, like um, let's say a uh, community-based architecture uh, or is very interesting for this because there's, uh, I, I know in Germany or in German speaking countries, there's Freifunk, in Spain, there's Wi-Fi with, with G. And these are very interesting initiatives because these are people that are saying, we don't want a service provider that treats us like this. And they come together and they create their own, uh, uh, yeah, with their skills. You know, these are people from like say far away uh, cities in, in Catalonia and they come together to actually create their own uh, community build tools, of course, is a, is a process, takes time, but I'm pretty sure in the long run, these people will have access to internet as they want it, in the conditions they want. So, I don't know, I think that there's something also about uh, finding the connection is important, but also how do people like get together to, uh, to communicate on what they want. Yeah, I just follow up on that. I have a parallel project called Urbanizing the Digital that is actually quite precisely talking about that. Uh, how do we imagine a common oriented internet architecture? I think like to answer that, that it has to be answered in two ways. One is design, like how, like all the work that I've been doing, like how do you actually make people feel agency in owning their con content? It's an experiential question as well. Like, uh, like the fact that you can have control and versus whether you feel you have control is a different thing. And quite often people are really operated more on the emotional sense of things that like if I don't feel in control, then even if I'm in control, I wouldn't do that control, you know. So I think that is the things that uh, the designer has to figure out, like what is the what is the way to design where people actually have agency. For instance, we may have like P2P technology that is super empowering, but no one know how to use it. Like, what's the point of that? Like, you know. And then secondly, uh, I think it's also a highly political question is for the fact that actually user have no position at all like we don't know what our position is we just know that we don't like what we are having now but we cannot verbalize it to advocate what we actually want so in the end it became this whole battle like th this kind of like switching just thinking about this whole past decade at the first decade at the first half of the decade we hope that technology would save us from government and then the second half we hope the government save us from technology we have no position <laughs> whatsoever you know, um, so that kind of that kind of transition is actually very telling because the techno the digital technology is still not very accessible. So it's again, it's a design question. It's not so accessible enough for people to actually have a way to figure out what they actually want. So uh, like the the urbanizing the digital is basically this theory that uh, precisely like Joanne was saying that like how do we actually build up a kind of language that actually allow people to to think about it at that way 
while at the same time, the designer also starting to know how to program, how to design that experience that allow people to think about that way. And then I feel like that is the real fundamental way that when we user has the position and has the knowledge and language to talk about it, then, then we are actually being able to get on the table to discuss with government and private entities. Otherwise, we were only just like being swinging between those and then just like very upset because we have no agency. And that, I, I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, just to, yeah. I just wanted to say some practical thing as well that maybe Station of Common has taught me in the last, uh, in the last time is that with the current situation of uh, like uh, that we just went through, which is like the first time that we had like a common same state for everybody, at least with an internet connection and with a computer, I think this is the right moment to rethink twice which, which are the tools that, you're, that you are using day to day because yeah. they, get, uh, they, you, they get invisible uh, through their use, right? Like this is uh, kind of the, 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 what Macha Maluha was saying when, you, uh, when the, the infrastructure gets invisible. Before people, when they get water, they, so they will uh, clap about it, they will be happy about it. Now, you know, we just, we just forgot this water. There, there is water. And I think there's the same thing with some of the tools. And I think this moment that we all got together and we went through the same is the right moment to rethink all the tools that we use and maybe give some of them or the ones that you think that are, are most likely to be changed because you, uh, you can have, have something that's just not freemium or premium. I think this is just a small step, but then by small steps, maybe there's a, a bit of, um, of agency, collective agency that's great. So what I learned from our discussion today and somehow that, that we are that it's high time for the question what system actually. And then yes. we have to learn a lot in yeah. order to come there and that we have to take it in our hand, this imagination, but also this very concrete, practical labor towards it. Yeah. So thank you for making me this thank understand. You. And we need much more time, but this was a very, very important step for me. Yeah. So thank you very much for this wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may just add to what you say, I think we need to unlearn the system in order to create a new one. So, like, look back to ourselves, what we actually want, pretend that we never have a system before. And, uh, yeah, that's that. <laughs>